All right, guys, we're recording, just FYI. Hi, Eric. Hey, happy Friday. Oh, it's filling up. I see James Jirocki there. All right, the rocker. Getting any surf up there in Maine? There's some swell coming up. I did the other day, actually. When I, the first day I got here, I got some great surf. It was nice. I'm, gonna have to, I'm going down Sunday morning. I'm going to try to do a 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. session, then an 8 to 10 session. There you go. Um, they're saying it might be 3 to 4, so. Yeah. We'll see. A, there's like four or five days of solid surf coming up. Yeah. Are you going to be on the uh, instructor call? Ow. Oh. Eric? I don't know. I don't know if I'm invited. I didn't see one. <laughs> Well, no, the thing that went out for it, um, it's been going out, went out in the newsletter and everything else for the instructor course on Sunday. Oh, for that. Um, yeah. Any any past instructor is always welcome to join any instructor class because, one, it's a refresher for you. Two, it helps to give feedback to the people, new people taking it and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah I'll take always, a look. I don't – Always welcome for that. Well, hey, regardless, if you want to surf Sunday morning, I'm planning to be there by, by 6 a.m. I'll probably get up – leave here at 4 yeah, we'll see what's going on. What is what is the um, the parking situation up there? Did it let out of staters in yet? Yeah, you guys got to pay. That's all. This is the, that's dude, Maine is full of out of staters right now. Are you kidding uh, I me? I figured. But it's like Rhode Island, if you some beaches, if you don't have an uh, a Rhode Island plate, they won't let you in. Oh, because they're all paid beaches, right? Yeah, they are. But normally they'd let you in. Right now, it's like it depends. Yeah, on the yeah, beach. yeah. But yeah, but that's an easy way for them to, uh, because they're all paid, they can, you know, like your beach doesn't have anybody. They got the Yahoo's walking up and down the street, but nobody's really doing anything. Hey, Steve's on. Outstanding. Hey there. John, I added in those other, uh, other uh, pictures this morning for your presentation tomorrow. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. So I'll, I'll uh, did you did you see the presentation I sent you, the first draft, the link I sent you via when email? Did you when did you send it? Yesterday. Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I I, I, ha I haven't been down down on the computer since uh, like after I I spoke to you. I had sent the thing down. Yeah. All right. Cool. Cool. <laughs> All right, everybody. Hey, it is eight a.m. So I'll do our official welcome to the Rockway. Warriors Weekend Virtual, excited to have this happening and have you guys on here with us. I'm hoping we have a great turnout. I see Mo up there in the corner on my screen. Outstanding. Mo, what's up? Augustine's on, Dan's here. The other people are just starting to file in, love it. Uh, so yeah, welcome, 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 welcome. Super stoked to uh, be able to have this event, even though we can't be on the beaches in Rockaway. It's still awesome to have everyone together had to share the stoke with you. And let me see if I can get the screen to advance. There we go. Oh, that didn't come out good, sorry. <laughs> Where'd you get that it. sign, Br Br uh, Dana? Brooklyn, baby, Brooklyn. Forget, about, Brooklyn. It. Forget Brooklyn. about it. Yes, that's on the Bell Parkway. I know, I know. So these pictures kind of go through kind of fast. There's about a thousand of them, so bear with. But just, uh, they're just quick shots from last year's event. So even though we can't all get together, we can at least uh, reminisce a little bit as you cycle through while we everybody starts getting on board here. And, There's Brett. Uh, showing up, so that's good to go. Standing. There's Jay. Cool. Expand this thing. Oh, that is a beautiful shepherd. The same dog. Yeah, it's probably go by too fast. <laughs> but uh, yeah, welcome, welcome everybody. Glad you could all make it. So we'll uh, have just a few minutes here of we'll let everybody get signed on and figure out their audio and their video and all that fun stuff. But, 
uh, this was a fun event last year. We had a really, really good turnout of folks, good crowd. <laughs> Mr. Healy right there, Tommy Nest. Mike Brown. Yeah. Chief Mike Brown. Hey, everybody's still seeing the uh, the slideshow, right? Not my text document. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Just just wondering. <laughs> Sometimes this thing, when I share, it doesn't seem to share properly. It's a kind of a pain. Mind of the So I'm gonna let this slideshow run for about, I don't know, five, six minutes. And then I've got a song that uh, uh, Jim Jaroki made for us, which is really cool. We'll, uh, we'll, he also did a video with it. So he grabbed some stuff off, off, the, off our Facebook and stuff like that and made a, made a cool video. So that'll be cool. Want to enjoy. I think the slideshow stopped just that you know. Yeah, I think it's pausing yeah. whenever I, oh, there it goes. If I, I think if I switch to my text to see what I got to say or whatever, it freezes uh, up. Yeah, no, it's good. The problem with making these, with all these pictures, is I have to use lower quality images or smaller, more compressed images. So it, uh, Oh. What's it like this weekend right now there in New York, guys? Cold, dreary, rainy. Oh, no. Well, maybe, maybe this is a blessing. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Next best thing. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been a little wash, so. In the comfort of our homes or our, our parks or wherever we may be today. If uh, just when we get started, everyone just remember to mute um, when we're doing the interviews and stuff like that, so we don't have background noises and stuff affecting other people on the on the call. What's his name? Anybody remember his name? His name is Je Jesse. Jesse, that's what it is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Could not for the life of me remember. Good morning, Ann. Good morning. How are you? <laughs> good. Good morning, Vincent. Good morning, sir. How are you? Living a dream, baby. Living a dream. Right. <laughs> so excited my, about having me in a party. Got, co got my coffee, my almonds, my protein drink. Life couldn't be better. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're way ahead of the game. I'm trying to get set up. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I got prepared two, two big old cups of coffee. I got protein drinks, sparkling waters, beef jerky, nuts. I'm, 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 I'm ready to hunker in and pound this baby out. <laughs> All right. Sounds great, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, glad, to, glad you're here. All right, I'm going to uh, cue that song up. Thank you, Jim. Jim, you want to introduce yourself really quick before I cue that up? I know you sent me a, a background, but yeah, you want to handle it for me? Sure. Uh, well, you know, I've been with uh, Answer for about uh, five to six years now. Uh, I am uh, now retired, but uh, I, I used to be a uh, 
I worked as a, in a corporate sector for quite a few years and going through college, I, I worked as a musician and uh, traveled around up and down the East Coast, uh, kind of uh, working my way through college and paying my way through college, worked, at, worked uh, for a few years full time after that. And uh, I just uh, happy to be involved with the uh, Amp Surf, and I thought that maybe uh, you know I could combine sort of my my love for the music and and, and for this uh, nonprofit and try and put it together in some kind of a uh, you know and it just uh, give something to everybody to kind of look at and think about and uh, hopefully uh, maybe rein in some more supporters. All right. Well, hey, we can't thank you enough. And we appreciate everything you've been doing with the program. I know you've been volunteering for yeah, a good five years at least. And uh, you've been a phenomenal instructor. I know you've you've saved my butt a couple of times. But I, <laughs> yeah, those waves in Rockaway break pretty quick and pretty hard. <laughs> so I appreciate everything you've done for us and really appreciate the, the doing the song. So without further ado, let me share that. So this is... All right, hold on. It has disappeared on me. Well, I'm not sure why it's not coming up, my brother. I've got it on my screen, but not coming up on here. Very interesting. Well, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do, guys. I am just going to play it and put the screen slideshow back on that we've been watching. And is that slideshow back on? Or what, what are you guys seeing right now? You. Just me? No, that sucks. I thought we'd like to calm down. <laughs> Hold on. Bear with. I do apologize. Tommy came across as Bigfoot there for a second. Yeah. <laughs> there he is again. Uh, sure he hasn't is. been sided in a while. I hope he's okay. He's cool. He's tripping. He's All right. You guys have to let me know if the sound comes through or not. We'll do Can you guys hear that sound? Nope. No? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's a bummer. <sighs> that's a bummer. I'm not sure why that's not working, guys. Um, I had it all queued up this morning. And it's still, it's, it's just not, for whatever reason, Zoom's not allowing that to come through. Uh, so enjoy the screenshots here for a bit longer and I'll work on it for a second. Maybe we can get it to work. Sounds good to you, too. Feel free to interact and all that good stuff. <laughs> no one needs to be muted at this moment. No one, no one can actually, no one can. I'm gonna switch over to Ashley here in just a minute. Ashley, you wanna, why don't you go ahead and actually start us in our, our stretching routine? And uh, we'll get going on that. Did everybody see Ashley okay? Screenshot still. I am slideshow frozen. Okay, let me stop that share and we'll put up Ashley. There's you. There's everybody see everybody Tommy. right now? Yeah. yeah. Tommy. So I, th I, I think it's going to keep. Uh, <laughs> Ashley should be spotlighted. <laughs> All right, there she is. Outstanding. No, if everybody could please mute while Ashley's doing the stretching, thanks. Oh, um, well, thanks, Dana. Thanks, everyone. Um, if we haven't met, I'm Ashley. I'm part of the uh, Amsterdam New York City chapter, um, coming to you from what feels like the middle of a tropical storm here in New York. So um, uh, I guess we're, it's good we're doing this online. Um, just wanted to start off and say, um, in the spirit of this particular event and this weekend, um, a big thank you to all of our veterans for their service. Um, uh, Dana and everybody on the line. Um, and my father's a veteran as well, so um, you know, truly grateful and appreciative of everyone's sacrifices. Um, and also, you know, given current times, just a shout out to anyone on the line who might be an essential worker. Um, you know, we are still in a pandemic, so hope folks are um, staying safe um, and well there. Uh, in addition to uh, being a member of Amsterdam, I'm also a yoga teacher. 
Um, and so I wanted to just lead us through some yoga stretches. Um, for anyone that doesn't already incorporate yoga into your surfing practice, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, it's great just as a, as a prep warm up when you're on the beach, just to get some stretches in, take some deep breaths. Um, it also helps you kind of remain calm when you're in the water. If you get into a situation that might not be um, one you want to be in, um, it's always good to come back to that breath and, um, and really utilize that. I think most people on the phone already know how to do that, but um, if you don't, then, you know, check it out. Um, so yeah, I guess I just want to begin with all of us just taking some deep collective breaths together. So if everyone can just exhale all the air out and then inhale through your nose for one, two, three, four, five, and exhale that out again, two, three, four, five. And we'll do that four more times. So inhaling, and exhaling that air out. It's good. Again, inhaling for five. And exhaling that air out. Two, three, four, five. Two more times, just an inhale. And exhale, let it go. And final time, inhaling for five. And exhale, let that go. Awesome. So as we do that, we just want to start to loosen up our neck. So take your gaze and bring it down toward your lap and gently start to roll your neck over to the right. Be the opposite there on this camera, but bring your uh, ear about as high as your chin, I mean your shoulder, and then let that go and come back through center and then up and over to the left side, ear about as high as your shoulder, and then let that go, come back through center and move it back over to your right side. Just stretching out the neck here, starting to warm up the back of that body. And over to the left. Take this two more times, so down over and up and to the right. And through center to the left. One more time, down and over to the right. And then exhale down and over to the left. And then bring your head, drop down through center, staring at your lap, and just gently roll your neck back up. And we're going to start doing some shoulder shrugs. So inhale and take your shoulders all the way up to your ears. Feel that tension, tight, 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 and then exhale, roll them down your back, let that go. One more time. Inhale, bring the shoulders up, lift toward the ears, tension tight, and exhale, let that all go. One more time. Inhale up to the shoulders, and exhale, let that go. And then um, we like did this last time. So um, if you were on that call, just uh, give yourself some space. We're gonna do like a sitting cat cow. Um, so essentially you're gonna sit really tall, straight spine, and then start to um, inhale, bring your belly out and look up, lift your chest for a cow pose in your seat. And then exhale, round your stomach, suck your belly in and start to arch your back for a cat pose in your seat. Inhale, come forward for cow, lift the chest. Shine the heart up and forward, and exhale, let that go. Arch the back for cat spine. So take a couple more, you can move a little faster. And this just warms up the whole back chain of your body. Um, always good before you're serving to warm up your spine, prevent injury that way. And take one more cat, and then let that go. Come back to a seated neutral position. Sorry, by the airports, there might be some outside noise. Um, we're going to start by uh, next moving to lifting our arms. So take your arms out up into the side and lift them overhead. Inhale and then exhale kind of slowly like you're moving through mud. Bring those down with a little bit of tension all the way back toward your sides. And then one more time. Inhale, lifting the arms up. Take it in. Breath in. And exhale slowly like you're moving through mud. Just bring those back down towards your side. Then we're going to take just our left hand. Lift that up and start to slightly bend over toward the left, getting a nice stretch on the left side body here. Take a breath in, and on your breath out, bring that left hand back down, and bring your right arm up. Take a counter twist on the other side. And one more breath here, and then let that go, and come back down through center. Now we're gonna bring both arms up and overhead one more time. And as we do that, we're slowly gonna to start to twist to the left. Bring your right hand to your left knee, bring your left arm behind you and just start to twist 
talking at the camera so you can hear me, but look behind you. On your inhales, you want to get a little taller, and on your exhales, you want to twist a little deeper. And on your next exhale, you can go ahead and let that go, turn back around, come towards center, and then inhale your arms up again. And exhale, twist over to the right this time, so your left hand is coming onto your right knee, and you're looking behind you, inhaling to twist a little deeper, and exhaling to sit a little taller. We'll be good to go. Thanks so much, guys, for having me. And I'm really looking forward to all the presentations today. So um, excited to get started. All right. Hey, thanks, Ashley. Hey, Jim, we've got that song queued up for you. So we're going to do that. And then we're going to introduce Brett. So let's see if this will share this time. <laughs> Hold on just a second. Here we go. Everybody see that screen? Association of T Surfers? Yep. All right. Jim Song, Ocean Healing. Here we go. Hopefully, you hear it as well. Okay. Everybody hear it? Can you guys see it? Shake your heads. We can see it, Dana, but we can't hear it. Uh, Dan, I cannot hear it. I can see the, the slides there. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. Outstanding, outstanding. Very cool. Uh, so, hey, next up, we've got Brett Carter with us, and he has put together a video on breaking free from anxiety and stuff. So, Brett, thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Uh, so, we're going to play the video, and then Brett's going to be available to ask, uh, answer any questions anyone has after. Uh, he was with us on our last call. And so, Brett, we really appreciate it. We appreciate you being a part of our team. And Brett's also on our advisory board. So, Brett, I'm going to start your video, and then uh, we will uh, get you up for questions. <laughs> Share that screen. Dana, if we can't hear it, because we couldn't hear the other video, if we can't hear it, we could just do it live. If it doesn't oh, could you not hear the song? No, I couldn't hear the song. Ah, killing me. I no. put it into a PowerPoint. I thought you guys could hear it. I apologize. Well, Give me a, a yes or no head shake if you can if you can see it or not or hear it. That's a bummer. I was hoping these videos would work. Um, nope. Can you guys see it? It yeah. hasn't started playing yet. No, oh, sorry. So let's see. Can you guys hear it? No. No. Okay. Well, we will. Uh, if I turn it up, can you guys hear it now? 
No. All right. Thank you. So sorry. Oh, Dana, maybe yeah. put your headphones in. That's taking the audio. Uh, I don't know. Can you hear it now? No. No. Okay. Well. Let's go live, baby. Here. Let's go live. We we got the okay. man in the house. So. <laughs> so. Hey, Brett. Mm -hmm. I lost my screen here. It's all good. It's all good. So, uh, Dana, thanks for having me. It's always an honor to be with uh, Ampsurf. And um, so what I want to share, I want to dovetail into what Ashley just brought us through, you know, those great physical movements to release some tension from um, our body. Uh, the technique I want to share, which many of you probably heard already uh, from my last time I was here, is uh, stressed upper breath work. And that's what I was explaining in that video. Um, that was for the Open Center. They put together this program called New Yorkers for New York. And, um, you know, a bunch of practitioners put up like a 10 minute video just to share quick and easy ways to reduce stress and anxiety. So I'll just share the, you know, the basic steps of the technique. Um, the biggest thing with stress is having the awareness that you're actually stressed, right? Some of us are kind of like running at 90 miles an hour and not even realizing it. So um, I encourage you to look out for your stress signals, right? Uh, so your heart rate, if your heart starts pounding, that's your body sounding the alarm. So I want a little light bulb to go off, say, hey, I'm stressed, okay? And it's no big deal when you're stressed. We get stressed on average of 50 times a day. It's okay to have a stress reaction. It's how we handle it. Um, another uh, stress signal is your emotions. If you're upset about something, um, turn off the news. No, I'm just kidding. If you're upset about something, that just means your body's stressed out. That's an emotional uh, signal. If you're having worrisome thoughts, right, just running through your head, it's no big deal. Your body's just stressed again. And then also your breath rate. Um, I think your breath rate is probably a pretty good sign when you're in the water, especially. Um, and if you're working with other surfers, that's a pretty easy sign to see as well. So, um, now, what do you do when we're stressed out, right? When we, we understand we're stressed, you know, the light bulb went off, you recognize your body's stressed. I just want you to take your right hand, touch the tension in your body. For me, it's like 99% of the time it's in my chest. Once in a while, I'll feel it in my stomach or my gut or my solar plexus, but usually it's right here. So I put my hand there. That's the first step. Then the second step is I start breathing deep and slow, okay? So whenever I'm stressed, I touch the tension, I start breathing deep and slow. <clears throat> we all can do that. It's very simple, okay? Uh, science behind that tells us that deep, slow breathing manually switches us from stress to rest. So you take control of that by doing that. Um, the third step is using a mantra. Mantras have been used on this planet for over 5,000 years. They work. It's just a matter of having the right mantra. So this one I found really good at dismantling stress. It's the K mantra, okay? So touch the tension, breathe deep and slow. Once you silently say, I'm okay, right? About two minutes, and you're just gonna get tension released from the body. Your thoughts are gonna clear and your emotions will come back into balance, okay? So um, that's a simple technique, right? Touch, breathe, I'm okay. Um, when you're in the water, if, being in the water is a very unique experience. We're in a different element. Normally we're in, you know, interacting with the air, right? But when you're in the water, you're in a whole different element. So your body unconsciously starts to align and keeps you focused. That's what keeps us in the moment once we step foot in the water, once we're in the water. If you notice, you're not worried about other things, about the future or the past when you're in the water. So um, that's a beautiful thing about the water. It kind of relaxes us. But it could also be scary. If you fall off the board the first time, if you... Um, you know, get taken on white water. If you get hit by the board for the first time, uh, you go under if you're in over your head for the first time. So panic is the biggest killer in the water, right? Um, even sharks smell panic, fear in the water. So panic is the biggest killer, right? Staying calm is, is the key that gives you the clarity in your mind so you can receive the, action, the answers to do the right action. Whatever the situation is in the water, staying calm is the key for me anyway. That's what I believe. Um, so now I would love to bring you guys through a quick uh, guided meditation. Um, Dana, is three minutes all right? Oh, it's perfect. Go ahead. All right, cool. So I encourage you to um, 
close your eyes, get as comfortable as you can. Typically when people do this, they're lying down. Um, but close your eyes, put one hand on your heart. And if you have another hand free, you could put that on your belly button, right? And just follow along with the words in my voice, okay? I want you to start breathing deep and slow. Focus your mind on the airflow coming in and out of your body. I want you to bring your awareness to the tip of your nose and feel your next inhale gently enter the tip of your nose. Breathing a little deeper and a little slower, following that airflow in, allowing it to open up your sinuses, each breath making it easier and easier to breathe. Breathing deep and slow, following the airflow, allowing it to unlock and release all the tension from behind your eyes. Breathing deep and slow, following the airflow towards the back of your mind. allowing all your thoughts to just unwind effortlessly with each breath. Breathing deep and slow, following the airflow down your throat, allowing it to fill up your lungs with life force. deep inside your chest, allowing each breath to unlock and release tension. From the center of your chest. Following the airflow a little deeper to your heart. unlocking and releasing tension from every single part. Allowing that airflow to effortlessly move through the source of the anxieties that were bothering you. Unlocking and releasing old emotions, any old memories. bringing you to a place where you're completely free of anxiety. Feeling that airflow directly into your chest. Always remembering the way, touching the tension. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. And wiggling your fingers and your toes, your wrists and your ankles, shoulders and your neck. And opening your eyes when you're ready. So that was just a basic short guided meditation just to get you a little bit of tune with that process of focusing on your breath, breathing deep and slow, and then once per breath saying I'm okay. So if you guys have any questions, um, I'm always available for anyone NAMSURF.
Uh, you can email me at brett at stressisgone.org. Hey, awesome, Brett. Thanks so much. Yeah, if anyone has any questions for Brett, by all means, please ask away. We've got a few more minutes. And uh, Brett, if you could just on the chat, share your website and your contact info with everyone, that would be awesome. Um, Brett, I wanted to, so I've, I've done your, your, uh, your workbook on PTSD management, and it's a one year process. Uh, you want to just talk about uh, a little bit on that? Sure. So the, the workbook um, focuses on the technique that I just shared, but it applies it to many different areas, right? So the first key to managing PTSD is learning how to stop a stress reaction. So we basically take that technique that I just shared with you and we marry it to your biggest stressors, okay? So the things that stress us out the most, we have an app called Stress Is Gone. You can look it up and download it. Um, use the, the tab at the bottom, it's called the stopper tab and it actually will stop your stress. So it'll ping you right before you're most likely to be stressed and it guides you through that same meditation, right? So now you have your stress trigger and now you have this meditation, we bring it together and over time the meditation wins because every cell in your body wants to become relaxed. It desires homeostasis. It doesn't like stress, right? Even though we're all stressed to the gills, our bodies don't like it. The next thing the book does is it discusses um, the second key, which is process the trauma. So we take the technique, the simple three-step technique, we activate the body's relaxation response, and then we bring up those traumatic memories from our past, wherever they are, one at a time, and we introduce them to the technique. And that actually releases the tension from those old memories and from the body and from our psyche. And the last thing the book does is it helps you configure your whole meditation practice and it uses uh, stress stop or breath work as the meditation guide, right? Some folks have trouble meditating. They get their thoughts, you know, they get frustrated if they feel like they're not doing it right. Um, as long as you're sitting down, you're quieting everything around you and your eyes are closed, you're doing great, right? But this technique hel helps you laser focus your mind and your breath to give you a really dip, deep relaxation, a deep, rich experience of meditation. So that's the three keys. Learn how to stop a stress reaction, uh, process the trauma, and meditate every day. And um, this technique has been helping my clients. It took me about eight years to kind of hone the technique and to crystallize it, and it's been helping people for about 12 years now. So it's a very special nice. technique. It works really fast, and I would love for you guys to use it anytime you want. And hey, I just, yeah, go ahead. So I don't know, a question uh, we had in the chat was, uh, should the Breathing, should breathing be directed through the stomach as opposed to the chest or? Yeah, so great question. That's awesome. So it sounds like that person knows what they're talking about. There's a thing called diaphragmic breathing, right? Where you actually breathe deeper, right? And when I lay down and do this, naturally, your breath is going to start, as your body relaxes, you're going to find that your stomach rises and falls, not your chest. Adults breathe through our chest, chest and that's a function of our stress, how much stress we're under. Um, if you watch a baby sleep or a young child, you'll find that their stomach rises and falls, not their chest as they're sleeping. That's the state we want to get back to. However, all the trauma in our heart from our life experiences is what I use the meditation to do. So I go in through the heart to unlock and release the memories, the emotions, to bring us back to balance in the heart. After we do that, it's a more natural experience um, to breathe from the diaphragm and from the, from the lower abdomen. So that was a great question. Uh, it's all part of the process to get there. All right, cool, well, thanks. Jim, thank you for that question. We really appreciate it. Uh, so hey, now we're gonna do our first interview and that's gonna be, uh, Dennis is gonna be interviewing Tommy, I believe that is correct. Let me share Tommy's PowerPoint here. Get that up. Everybody see Tommy now, I hope. Give a thumbs up if you do, and we appreciate that. And so actually Doug's gonna be interviewing Tommy. So Doug, why don't you go ahead and take it over? Thanks, Dana. Um, so Tommy, I'm just gonna give a, a brief bio of you before we start the questions. Um, good. Thomas Cunningham um, grew up in West Palm Beach, Florida. We graduated from Seminole um, Ridge High School in 2008. Um, and was a the swim team captain with a 100% Florida F Bright Futures scholarship. After attending University of Central Florida for a short time, he decided to answer the call and joined the US Army just before his 19th birthday. While deployed in 
Logar, Afghanistan. He was escorting a supply unit back from Fob Shank when his vehicle struck an IED. The blast was devastating to his right leg, but luckily there were no other injuries. <clears throat> Weeks later, Tommy had to make the difficult decision to have his leg amputated below the knee. Recovery was a long road, but Thomas found renewed strength and hope when he returned to his favorite sport, surfing. It's carried over to all aspects of his life, and he pushed harder than ever to take up activities like flying, light sports, air, airplanes, paramotors, rock climbing, spin fishing, hiking, and many other outdoor activities. Today, Tommy travels the United States in his schoolie bus as an ambassador of Stoke to bridge the gap between the differently abled and the world just out of their reach. Tommy's surfing career is awesome, and he has won several surf contests in his divisions, including the 2019 US Adaptive Open and 2018-2019 Hawaii Adaptive Championships. Tommy, this is very impressive, and thank you again for your service. Thank you. I have served with, surfed with you a couple of times, and what is not mentioned in your resume, in my view, is your most awesome achievement. It's your lower. It is infectious, and always being in the ocean with you is an amazing experience. <clears throat> For those who are not aware, low is an, an essence of being, love, peace, compassion, and mutual understanding and respect. Aloha means living in harmony with people and the land around you with mercy, sympathy, grace, and kindness. And if any of you have shared some ways with Tommy, you know that it's an awesome experience. Tommy, I know that you also <clears throat> work with MSIP as an instructor. How does it feel to share the healing power of surf therapy with your fellow veterans and others living <clears throat> with various conditions and disabilities? Um, well, thanks for having me first off. And um, for me, working with AmpSurf and similar programs has been the most important part of my recovery. I, over the years and my personal experience, have discovered that um, recovery is going to be a lifelong process that I'm not ever going to be done working on myself to better myself, better my mental state, better my physical state. Um, and so by taking all the lessons that I've learned throughout these years and getting the opportunity to share them with other people, not only do I get the reward of witnessing their stoke, but I also get to reinforce the things that I have learned to better improve upon myself. And so it goes both ways to give, I get as much as I give in. I, I mean, I've done a couple of um, AMSA clinics as an instructor and it's, I prefer teaching, I'll get more stoke teaching someone, seeing them catch a wave than catching a wave myself now. I think you get to that stage of your life. Yeah, those are some of the best surf sessions ever. When you teach a newbie and you just see them light up inside. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> and then, I mean, you've got quite an illustrious um, competitive career. What do you, um, what type of surfboards do you ride and what, what alterations have you made to them, if any? Me personally, as a, a BK amputee, I've tried my best to not um, customize my surfboards too much. Because I travel a lot, if I bring a custom surfboard with me and it breaks, it's going to be really difficult to get something similar. Um, so I try to surf uh, regular short boards, regular long boards that I just buy off of the shelf. But when I do get the opportunity to get a custom made board, um, because of the nature of my injury, I usually get the deck reinforced and the rails reinforced um, because that prosthetic can come down pretty hard and put cracks in boards and uh, yeah, I've gotten good at repairing them, but uh, it is annoying. So try to reinforce the ones that I get custom builds. And the only real customization I have is actually to my prosthetic. I am goofy foot and my prosthetic's my front leg. So I made my prosthetic about an inch and a quarter shorter than my leg actually should be. And that makes it so my toes miss the top of the surfboard and I'm able to pop up more naturally and uh, get into a better stance quicker, which is critical for big waves. Great. <clears throat> and that's actually what we were talking about. I think it was with peg leg a while ago, yeah. <clears throat> how the prosthetic is developing and how that's becoming an important part of your surfing and adapting to, to the surfing, not, not as much the surfboard. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> Um, and then some of your favorite spots. Tell us where to, what are your favorite spots and why you prefer those spots. Um, so I've, I've 
just started to really travel and get into international surf. And so I got a lot to discover out there in the world. But so far in my life, I'd have to say that uh, Sumbawa, Indonesia is my favorite spot to surf, mostly because uh, while I was there, there were very heavy waves of consequence and only me and a handful of my friends that traveled there together. So empty breaks for days and I got uh, some of the best training of my life. I almost drowned twice and <laughs> not drowning and discovering that I can survive surf that big just gave me so much more confidence to go out and push my boundaries. And so Sambawa was very critical in me moving towards big wave surfing when I was out there every day in 10 to 12 foot surf. Nice. <clears throat> and you spent quite a bit of time in Hawaii, I think too, huh? Yeah, Hawaii, there is no place like it uh, that I have discovered. Like I said, still got a lot more traveling to do, but um, some of my more traveled friends have, uh, have they, they bit the bullet and just decided to live in Hawaii no matter how broke it was going to make them because there's just no better waves out there. I, in Indonesia, I did sometimes find myself wishing I was in Hawaii when I looked at the Hawaiian swell report, so I just stopped looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> And spots that you haven't surfed that you would um, like to go to? Yeah, I'm really interested in discovering more of Indonesia. I was only there for three months, and that's, I mean, there's thousands of islands there. Um, mm -hmm. Southeast Asia in general is one of my favorite parts of the world. And I, I want to go out to the Mens, uh, go surf Mentawai. And I'm also really excited. My number one wave that I want to surf is Chicama in uh, Chile. I know. Uh, yeah, I've got a couple of friends in Australia and they often go to Mentawai and those kind of places and they said it's, yeah. of, it's paradise. So, yeah. That's what I've heard. <laughs> maybe, maybe one day Dana will send you an idea. <laughs> yes. Maybe and I then, um, just what do you think surfing does for you, you physically and mentally? And overall, how do you see it helping others as a form of therapy? Um, I... I think that the two are very interconnected. You know, it goes beyond uh, like look good, feel good. To me, it's more like um, just the, the physical act of getting out there and working your body releases endorphins in, in your mind that help to calm you down, help to get you closer to that flow state where we talked about how when you go surfing, you can leave all of your problems on the beach. That's exactly what it is for me. When I don't get to go surfing for a while, um, I start to notice that I, I get down and I get stressed easier. And no matter what is ailing me, I can leave all those problems on the beach and go surf and have peace of mind the whole time I'm out there while also getting that physical aspect, you know? Um, I'm, I'm working hard so that I can feel well, not just good and get back to a level of wellness that uh, I deem is good for me. <clears throat> yeah, understood. And also the camaraderie, I find sitting out there with a whole lot of guys and, and girls talking nonsense, looking out for each other if the surf is big, you know, that kind of stuff, I find that great. Um, if I'm grumpy, my wife tells me to go surf, so that helps. <laughs> yeah, um, sounds like a keeper. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm grumpy often, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> So tell me from the picture, it looks like you do a lot of other sports um, besides you know, flying um, and being in the water. What other sports do you recommend to other adaptive surfers or people with um, just a living with disabilities? Well, for me, I, I grew up a skater and a surfer. So transitioning to other board sports was natural, like flowboarding and snowboarding. Um, I'm really interested in getting into kite surfing, but being a combat wounded veteran, um, I experienced a long period of time where I was exposed to a lot of adrenaline and um, a lot of stress. And actually, those things can become addicting. And so when I got out of the military, I discovered that getting into extreme sports, although they can be dangerous, as long as you're working within the confines of your training and your ability, you should succeed. And um, it was giving me those hits of adrenaline that uh, I didn't even realize I was withdrawing from. Um, and so for me, I would recommend that anything that really gets your heart racing. You know what? What gets my heart racing might uh, make somebody else have a heart attack. So I can't say like just go out there and jump on a paramotor and start flying, but it is possible. And there's a, 
an adaptation for just about every single sport out there. And if there isn't, um, there's a lot of people out there that want to try to figure it out. And so anything that really gets your heart racing, not just uh, from the physical activity, but also from the excitement. Um, novelty helps to create and reinforce new pathways in your brain that actually help you to perform better at the things that you're already good at. And so trying new things in general is an, addi an addiction of mine. I love to try just any new sport that really um, has a sense of community, sense of purpose to, to get up and go do that sport. And it's, yeah, just um, for me, snowboarding has become one of my new favorites, and I almost like it more than surfing. <laughs> uh, we have to keep on seeing you at the beach, buddy. That yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess it's, it's so long as you trained properly and you're within your skill level, it's, it's, a, it's adrenaline, it creates adrenaline, but it's still safe. You know, you've still got that aspect of danger, but it's within your capability to recover from. Anything yeah, goes. and it's within my control. My life isn't in the yeah. hands of somebody behind a trigger that I can't see on a building far away. Um, yeah. These extreme sports, inherently dangerous as they are, all of the dangers are, most of them, I mean, outside factors like weather, you can't control. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, I am in control of mm. the situation, and I, I get to determine how I, I call it spiciness. I get to determine how spicy it gets. Yeah, it's you, your call whether you paddle out if it's huge or not. You know, you know your limitations and you know, yeah. what you can and can't cut. No, that's true. So um, many of our participants come to us um, not only with physical conditions, but mental um, health ones. Um, sorry, uh, sorry, I'm going, I'm going to go on to the next one. Um, I know you and Dana were at Nelscott Reef this winter. Can you tell us what it was like riding those giant waves there? Eh? It was a very interesting experience. I had not surfed waves that big in a really long time since I'd had two legs still. Um, it was definitely a little bit outside of my comfort zone, which I'm, I'm very fond of doing, pushing my boundaries. I wouldn't have gone out if I thought it was way out of my comfort zone. Sure. Um, but you, you need to nudge yourself in, in towards that fear. And I used that fear and harnessed it to pay more attention, to focus more on my breathing, to, to make better wave selection choices, um, to be more patient. And, um, you know, it, it was very terrifying. And I'm not 100% sure if it is actually for me. The risk versus reward there was really on the edge of, of being balanced. And I really want to give it another shot. I want to continue to train hard and get in even better shape for the next big wave season. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely going to, to try it again. But if um, I experience the same thing that I don't think the risk and reward is balanced, I may stop doing it. Um, it, yeah. it I just might not be for me. Yeah, because I think there you've got a lot of times you've got one chance. If you get in the wrong place on some of those waves, you're in deep trouble. Yes, yes. <clears throat> and that pretty much leads us into our, our, our last question. Um, our lesson today is about how to pick waves. Um, any tips for um, everyone, beginners and to the advanced guys? Yes, um, I actually been thinking about this a little bit and really uh, boils down to a couple, but mainly patience. Um, all too often I find myself losing my patience and catching getting to catch a wave but then i get off of that wave and i look behind it and realize that uh, i i could have waited an extra couple of seconds to see what the set behind it was doing um when it comes to surfing it, and reading the waves you a lot of people need to understand that it's like learning to speak and read a new language um, you have to learn the way that the ocean speaks to you and learn these signs and these cues. And it takes, just like anything, it takes time. Um, it's not something that you can read in a textbook and just show up and be able to do. Not everybody. Um, it will take experience. It will take time to get better at it. And it is something that you should continue to try to get better at throughout your entire surfing career. Um, and just, like I said, be patient because there usually is a better way of coming. Yeah. And that's the problem I find with a lot of beginners. They're impatient. They just paddle for whatever comes their way. 
Yeah, and wave count is important, of course, especially as a beginner. Get those waves up. But uh, as you start moving into the novice and intermediate level, it becomes much more important to be patient and pick your waves so that you can be using those fun surf sessions as a way to train and up your surfing to the next level or to at least the, the level of progression you personally want to get at. Absolutely. Tommy, that's it. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate your time. Um, you're, a, you're an inspiration. Um, and thank you again for your service, for all you do for our community, and for sharing your journey with us today. Um, hope to get in the water with you again soon, when, if you're down in Central Coast. Just yeah, I can't wait. I should be heading that way soon after uh, the Oregon Amp Surf Clinic at the end of the month. Great, because you know, Dana, Dennis, and I, I'm sure, can't wait to get in the water with you. So. We'll, Thanks, yes. thanks again for this, Tommy. You're, you're a huge inspiration and a great job. Thank you, brother. Hey, thanks, Tommy and Doug. Uh, if anyone's got any questions for Tommy, we've got a few more minutes. We can uh, we'll fire away at him. All righty, Dennis here. Hey, Tommy. Um, up, what do you say for What do you say for uh, uh, people that you know want to get into some big waves and you know they're trying them out? You know, what do you say to uh, individuals? How do they get past? a major hold down. How do you, they get past freaking getting pounded and, and then, and then questioning themselves. How do you, what do you say to them to uh, help settle their minds or what do you do to uh, help you get back in that water, get back on the saddle again? Well, like I said before, with these extreme sports, like working within the confines of, of your comfort zone and your training is important. So when it comes time, you think you're ready to get into big wave surfing, there is a lot of training involved with working on your breath hold, working on um, stopping your stress levels, because a hold down is very scary. I have been held down to the point um, twice in my life where I actually thought that that was it I, in my mind I reached a state of calmness where I was like this is how Tommy Cunahan dies and I thought I was not going to make it and then I popped up to the surface immediately went in coughed up a bunch of water threw up on the beach but I pre replayed it over and over and again in my mind and yeah I got I got pounded by that but I decided instead to harness that fear and use it to my advantage to focus better the next time that I'm out there and also remind myself that I did survive it once, which means I can do it again. So if you make it through it and you get a really good, uh, really gnarly hold down or you get a really gnarly slam into a reef and it's that you feel like that fear is holding you back a little bit, just remember that you already moved past it once before and you've already conquered it. Now you just need to conquer the fear that's, that's holding you back and, and not necessarily get rid of it because it is a useful resource. It's a reason why we feel fear and it, it is useful if you learn how to harness it properly. Great answer. Thank you very much. Because it, honestly, it, uh, uh, I almost died in Waimea many, many, many years ago. Surfing. I think the only thing that got me back in the water was not, I mean, honestly, was not being afraid of my fear. I, I was, did not want to be afraid of, of that ever again. I did not want to be afraid of the water. And that's what forced me to get back in the water. So, um, I dig it. Thank you for your answer. That was very reinforcing. Yeah. Uh, get back on the horse. Yeah, baby. Yep. Hey, thanks, Tommy. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Tommy, if you can stick around, we'd love to have you stay around. Uh, if anyone's got more questions for Tommy, feel free to reach out to him uh, via the chat. And Tommy, if you want to share your contact info via the chat with everyone, that would be great, too. Uh, and uh, right. yeah. I gotta say, I, I couldn't agree more with Doug. It's always a pleasure and, and uh, uh, just awesome was to have the opportunity to surf with you. And I, I hope we're at Del Scott again this year. Yeah. yeah I, want us to, I want us to hit that again. Yeah. Uh, up next, we're going to have, uh, Justin is going to share, um, your weight, how to pick your, the waves and, uh, when you're out there. So let me just switch over the, uh, video here real quick. Justin, are you with us? Yeah. Can you hear me? All right. I can hear you just fine. So, uh, this is another video that we had set up, uh, but we're having obviously having some sound issues. So I'm going to play the video while Justin just narrates it. And so uh, hopefully all works well. Uh, here we go. I'm going to stop that share. So, well, Dana's setting that up. Uh, I am so stoked. Warrior Weekend in uh, New York. I love New York. I love Warrior Weekend. I'm just so uh, bummed that we can't be out there doing, uh, 
doing this the right way um, in person. But uh, maybe, uh, you know, my, my thoughts and prayers out to everybody in New York suffering through the pandemic. This is, this is a really rough time for, for New Yorkers, and uh, my heart goes out to you. Uh, I am really excited today to, to talk about, um, about surfing, and this is Catching an Unbroken Wave. It's part of our beginning uh, to be a surfer series. You know, it's, it's one of those plateaus that really defines you be, be, between um, somebody who wants to be a surfer and somebody who actually becomes a surfer. So uh, it's it's actually a very difficult thing to do. So I put this together. Uh, I'm looking forward to sharing it to you. Can't wait to see your thoughts. And this is a, made from a lot of great video that we picked up in Costa Rica and uh, and some video we got here in Rhode Island. So I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. Here we go. All right. Oh man. <laughs> a sec. All right, so I cannot see my notes because somehow this went to full screen on me. Let me let me uh, reduce this here if I can see if that helps. Can you pause it, Dana? I can, my brother. Thank you. Um, for some reason, when you hit play, it took a, it covered my screen, which had my notes on it. So um, okay. I can completely go off the hit, but I'd rather not if I can avoid it. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, Just let me know when you're ready, man. Yeah, sorry, folks. We're having some technical difficulties today. We've, these have been running pretty darn smooth. So, <laughs> Justin, turn off the full screen mode so that you can have two windows. I am uh, trying. Um, I did have <laughs> my full screen mode off. Let's see. And it somehow went on. Oh, oh view options. Let's see. Um, okay, yeah, that'll work, I think. Is that working, brother? Yeah. I don't know. No, that didn't do anything. All right. Um, no worries. I'll make it happen. All right. Ready? Yeah. OK, here we go. I'm assuming no one can hear the audio from it. I can hear it loud and clear on my end, but it's not coming through on your end, I'm sure. So here we go. All right, so this is part of the beginning to be a surfer series. And, uh, you know, it's, it, uh, it is not uncommon for somebody to come to an amp surf clinic for the very first time. They've never surfed before and they catch 10 waves and they go, oh man, surfing is easy. I love it. They go out and buy a board and they find out that, hey, this is, this is completely much more difficult than I thought. So surfing is the art of being in the right position at the right time. And there's four different phases of wave you got to know about. Um, and so phase one is when the wave is uncatchable. No matter how hard you paddle, if you're in the right position, everything, you cannot catch a phase one wave. Phase two is when you want to be uh, catching the wave. That's the spot when the wave has enough power and enough curl that you can catch it. So you want to catch the wave at phase two. Um, phase three is too late. The wave is going to break on your back if you're trying to catch a phase three wave. And then phase four is whitewater. Um, and white water is great for learning how to surf. This is a great place where you can, you know, the wave pushes, the white water pushes you up and uh, you can get on the wave and you can practice your stand up. It's a, it's a great place to train. Um, wow, this video is really uh, shaky. It's not even like a video, it's a bunch, bunch of uh, shaky stills. But, anyways, um, so catching an unbroken wave is the art of being in the right place at the right time. Um, with the right amount of speed so that you can get onto a wave. And the key to that is positioning. So um, you want to start about 15 feet beyond where the wave's breaking. Right here, this is Jeff in Costa Rica, and he's in the right spot to get on this wave. Um, but a lot of beginning surfers will sit kind of right where the waves are breaking, and that's going to cause you to try to catch a phase three wave, and that's what happens to John right here. You can't, uh, you're not going to be able to make that. So uh, you want to sit about 15 feet beyond where the wave breaks, scan the horizon looking for a lump that's going to turn into a phase two wave. Then you turn face the beach and start paddling. I say turn and burn because you've got to get up to speed really quick. And then uh, as you get up to speed, you uh, can transition and catch the wave. And um, that's what Jason does right here. This is one of the Costa Rica waves. Um, but let's talk about paddling. Paddling is key because you got to be um, able to catch the wave and get up to speed of the wave quickly. So, like I said, a 
four wave is actually pretty easy to match the speed of because you lay in the white water and the white water pushes you and you kind of get right on the wave. But matching the speed of an unbroken wave is a whole other story. You've got to have good paddle technique, be in the right spot, and several other things. So um, good paddle strokes and in the right spot, and, and then uh, you can get onto a phase two wave, and that's what you want to do. So right here, Lynn is demonstrating the proper paddle technique, long, deep, strong paddle strokes to match the, the speed of the wave, and she can get into that wave um, perfectly. Uh, notice here, Jason is looking back several times before he catches this wave, and at the very last minute, he has to speed up his paddle to catch this wave. Um, so the look back is really critical in fine-tuning your, uh, your catching the wave. Also, positioning on your board is important. Um, many beginners um, will be too far back on their board and the nose will be too far out of the water and you can't catch a wave if your nose is too far out of the water. In fact, you need to put your head down and possibly even put your feet up as you're trying to catch the wave to get down the face of the wave um, and that's helpful. Um, if you don't do that, then the nose will come up as the wave, as you kept get on the wave and then you won't be able to catch the wave as this surfer finds out right here. And the wave lifts him up and his nose is out of the water and he just slides off the back of the wave. It's also important to take two good strokes after you think you've got the wave, you feel yourself cruising, take two more strokes before you try to stand up to make sure that you have the wave and then put your hands next to your chest, arch your back and pop up. <clears throat> So the, ar the arch back is key because that's, you know, I talked about having your weight forward. Um, after your last two paddles, you arch your back and that shifts your weight back and that prevents a nose dive. So uh, that arching of your back is really important. It also pauses you and you can kind of um, get a little bit under control and kind of ease into the wave. Uh, one common mistake is not standing up when you have the wave. Instead, you ride down on your belly. Um, that's a common mistake that a lot of beginning surfers have. So the last phase is once you're in the right position, you turn and burn, get up to speed. Um, you look back and make fine adjustments. And then um, two last paddles, arch your back, and then ease into the wave as uh, Mike demonstrates here in Costa Rica. So <laughs> here's some tips that you can use to catch an unbroken wave. Um, knowing where to sit is, is not always that easy. So look at the experienced surfers. Don't try to make this up on your own. Um, see where they're sitting to catch the waves and sit where they're sitting. And that's how you'll catch the waves. That's Eric, by the way, who's on the call with us here. Um, get a board that floats. So Jason here is on a long board and his uh, girlfriend Alexa is on a short board. Alexa's in a better position for this wave but she can't catch it because she's on a short board, whereas Jason gets into it no problem on the long board. Um, same story here with Eric on, on a long board. He's got three surfers in better position than him on that set wave, and he was the one that got the wave and no one else did. So a bigger board is easier to catch waves on. And the last tip is to be proactive. Paddle sideways to the peaks. Don't wait for the waves to come to you, go get them. Um, the more proactive surfers catch more waves. Um, now let's talk about wipeouts. Um, surfing is going to have a lot of wipeouts. Everybody wipes out. Good surfers wipe out. I wipe out. Um, I, I say, in fact, that if you're not wiping out, you're not pushing yourself and you're not learning good enough. So um, wiping out is good, but you want to avoid the nose dive. And the nose dive is when the nose goes underwater on takeoff, as Eric demonstrates right here, and then you go over the front of your board, and it's pretty scary. It's not, not a very fun wipeout, but... Um, it's typically about not being in the right position. Um, another reason that can cause a nosedive is not paddling enough. Um, in this case, John stops paddling before he actually catches the wave. He tries to stand up. And in this case, you're either gonna, one of three things are gonna happen. You're gonna go off the back of the wave, you'll fall at the top of the wave like John did, or you can kind of get pushed into the wave super late and then you're probably gonna nosedive. So uh, definitely don't stop paddling before you catch the wave. Another reason that you might nose dive is not looking back and fine tuning right before takeoff. This happens to Dana here. He got ahead of this phase two wave. And uh, so it ended up being a super quick takeoff, a super late takeoff. 
and he actually did a great job in the nose up, but it was really a tough takeoff. Um, and then uh, arching the back, basically transitioning your weight from forward to back has to be, has to be done pretty quickly. And in this case, Eric can't get it done quick enough and goes uh, for the nose dive. The, um, another thing is hesitating at the critical moment. Basically, uh, you realize, oh, it's going to be a steep drop and you stop paddling, you get a nose dive. Or if you try to catch a wave at phase three, you're going to nose dive. Uh, at this point, I like to point out that all waves are not created equal. Um, these waves right here that we just looked at, some of these surfers wiping out on, actually had a very small, tra they transitioned from phase one to phase three very quickly. So basically from not catchable to already too late very quickly. So even, and their uh, the takeoff zone shifted around quite a bit. So even really experienced surfers will have trouble in waves like that. So my point is, if you find yourself at a spot like that, hang out on the inside and just catch the whitewash and you know practice your stand up. You don't need to be um, trying to learn how to surf at a place like that. There are spots that have really big takeoff zones where they transition very slowly and there's this big um, takeoff zone where the waves in phase two and you can get on the wave. And that's where you wanna go learn. In general, that's places where we have our amp surf clinics for, uh, for the most part. So in review, I want you to sit 15 feet beyond the break zone, look for a wave that's transitioning from phase one to phase two, paddle into it, um, get up to speed or actually paddle to it, you know, be aggressive and paddle to the spot where the takeoff is. Um, fine tune your paddling to match the speed. So you want to look back and, and do your fine tune adjustments um, and then um, pa paddle onto the wave, bigger boards, catch more waves, keep your head low and shift your weight forward to get down the face. But then as soon as you catch the wave, take two extra paddles, um, then arch your back, get your nose back up, slow your transition into the wave, and pop up. So those are the steps to catching an unbroken wave. But, you know, you're not going to learn how to catch an unbroken wave by watching a video or listening to me. And, um, and I do recommend going back and looking at this video on YouTube because it's really jerky right now and it's actually smoother. Uh, and, and the narration on there. But um, what you need to do is get out there and practice and try to get in the right spot and, and practice. That's the only way you're gonna learn how to do this. One thing you can do though, is you can stand on the beach and watch the lineup, watch the waves as they roll in and just with your mind go, this is where I need to be to catch the wave. And then watch the surfers as they try to get to those spots and see how successful they are in catching wave um, as they're coming in. Um, don't get discouraged. This is a lot of work. It takes a lot of practice. Uh, too many wipeouts, but there probably will be because being out of position is something that you have to learn. But um, all your patience and hard work will be rewarded because nothing compares to dropping in on your first unbroken wave. Um, the videos were done by uh, primarily provided by Dreads and is a cobble wobble link. And then barefoot travel, barefoot surf travel had the diagrams that I used in this. So, um, so that's the class. Um, sorry that it was so jerky, um, and uh, hope you enjoyed it. If it. Let me know if there's any questions. Justin, thanks so much for uh, doing that, and uh, everyone, thanks for dealing with our bit of technical difficulties we're having. Did anybody have any questions for Justin regarding, uh, you know, how to catch those waves and stuff like that? Go ahead and hit it. I think I could add, um, Doug. With um, I noticed a lot, a lot of uh, newer surfers, how you know when they are popping up, a lot of times they're they're not getting their feet far enough forward. Um, I'd probably. Um, one of my suggestions to some of the people that, you, that, that I've helped is put their hands farther, you know, when you tell them to put their hands along side their chest, but even bring them even lower. Sometimes, uh, a lot of times if their hands are too far forward, like they're doing a bad push up, yeah, their feet will rarely go far enough forward where they end up on the tail of their, of their board. So like, that was awesome, brother. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's great advice. Um, in fact, I do tell people to uh, put their hands all the way back by the rib cage. Because that that helps them shift their weight back 
further also it keeps the nose up a little bit and um and then it, it is uh easier to uh get your feet for more further forward if you do that yes sir thank you brother good stuff i i had a quick question that might add some information to some beginners um how how would you recommend practicing um getting up to your feet out of the water so that you're better prepared <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, you can practice pop-ups just on the floor in, in your house. And um, it's, uh, it's actually a pretty difficult calisthenic. Um, if you, uh, you kind of think about, oh, I'll do uh, 10 pop-ups, it's, it's actually harder than doing 10 push-ups because there's kind of a, a, as in the word pop, you're popping, you really do a push-up and kind of jump up to your feet. And um, I, I was uh, telling my friends as we were getting ready to go on the Costa Rica trip that were new surfers. Yeah, do 50 pop-ups a day. <laughs> they call me back. Man, I tried to do it, and after 10, I couldn't do anymore. And, uh, 10 a day, Max. Yeah. yeah. So I tried some, and I was like, yeah, that is a lot. That, that's really tough. So, but, uh, yeah, yeah, if you, um, you want to practice that at, at home, it's, it's great practice, and, uh, and it will definitely pay off in the lineup. As you're, uh, I, I see, too, also on top of that question is, Take the fins off your board and put it on a mattress, a twin bed. <laughs> you get a little bit more bounce, you know, instead of trying to push up off a, a solid hard floor. Because when you get thick like me, man, you need as much help as possible. And it's a little bit more, more realistic as you're know, popping up on the ocean when you have that little bit of push, you know, that little bit of ocean cushion between your board and the water. So I've done that with, with my boards on. Just throw on the mattress when I've just done that as a kid. Oh, yeah, that, that's a great idea. Um, it'll be less stable. Not only will you get used to being on your board and having your feet go in the right spot on your board, but you'll have a little use practice with the balance issue of the, of yes. the, not the mattress. So yeah, that's definitely a great idea. Justin, John, uh, hey, John. just, just another way you can, uh, fit those squat thrusts in instead of telling them you want, you want 50, but do them in like a circuit in groups of 10 where they can get 30 seconds to a minute rest in between, and then they'll get the 50 in. Yeah. Sounds good, John. John, you're a machine. That's just going to say. Tomorrow, tomorrow <laughs> you guys will see pictures. Tomorrow we got Josh Loyon, who's on uh, Team USA. He's a blind surfer, and he does practice pop-ups with two straps spread between, like, two bars. It's, it's pretty, pretty intense. I like uh, – oh, my God. That's awesome, too. Yes. Yeah. The fact that he does it when he – being blind as well of course for us that can see you know it just seems impossible but for him he's, he's so much more in touch with all of his other senses it's, it's great and that dude's badass too. he's an um, awesome awesome guy yeah. to be in the water too yeah. oh yeah now we got time for about one more question if anybody has one for justin and then we're going to switch over to the next interview all right well, well, hey, if not, I was just going to add one bit. I know it's weird times and everybody's quarantined. Uh, some people aren't uh, able to get access to the beach and some beginners might not even have a surfboard and you're really interested in practicing to help you not develop bad habits. What I did in the beginning, practicing my pop-up at home, I'd put a piece of tape on the ground as long as the surfboard that I wanted to surf was. And that way I can look down at the carpet at my feet and see where my feet were landing and adjust with my next pop-up so I'm not developing bad habits. So that's a way for beginners to uh, start dialing in where your yeah. foot placement is going to be. Yeah. I've done that with that blue painting tape too. It works really yeah. good on the floor. Man, I got to get more hey, labor. Great stuff, everybody. Thank you all so much. Hey, Justin, great, great lesson. Sorry again, folks, the technical difficulty we're having today. Uh, our next guest is uh, is Chaka, and I'm going to have uh, Dennis is going to interview him, and he is the founder of Stoke for Life. So, uh, Dennis, if you're ready, go ahead and uh, you take it over, brother. Hey, Chaka Brada. Good, good to be able to interview you, my friend. I got to meet you and the crew this, this last uh, uh, Amp Surf uh, competition down in San Diego. So, Charles Chaka Webb was born in the 60s during the classic surf period great times and lives in beautiful Oceanside, California. Chaka is a paraplegic paralyzed from the waist down. Undaunted by his condition, Chaka has been breaking down barriers for himself and others for several years in paddling, paddle boarding and surfing and founded the organization Stoked for Life in 2015. 
His first paraplegic athlete, he is the first para, paraplegic athlete to compete in the open water paddle board races. In 2013 and 2014, he competed in the battle of the paddle in open group races in 2014, 15, and 17, and 18, the Hano Hano Huki Ocean Classic short courses. He completed the 2016 SFL Harbor to Harbor Ocean Challenge. It's a 25 mile open water paddle. He is the first paraplegic to complete in the Alcatraz Escape from the Rock um, Duathon, which is actually a 3.5 mile paddle and a seven mile run wheel. In surfing, he has set high standards as well in 2015. He was the Western Surfing Association Adaptive Surfing Champion Wave Ski Division, which I want to do want to touch on, and placed fifth in the world at the ISA Adaptive World Surfing Championship. In 2016, he placed second at Duke's Ocean Festival Access Surf Adaptive Surfing Championships, second place at the USA Surfing National Adaptive Championships. In 17, he finished third and placed placed the U.S. Open Adaptive Surfing Championships, fourth place in the USA Surfing National Adaptive Championships. In 2018, he placed fourth in the USA National Adaptive Championships. In 2020, he placed third at the 2020 ISA AMP Surf Para Surfing Championship, which was a pleasure to watch you and everybody else just go off. What a great time. Chaka also served, served on the ISA Competition Committee is the creator of the U.S. Adaptive Ocean Open Championships and is sponsored by Sticky Bumps and King Paddle Sports. So, Shaka, again, thank you for, for so much for being on the call. And please tell us, how does it feel to surf in all those competitions? And I'm telling you, uh, teaching with Amp Surf, there's so many people we've taught that want and uh, that are inspired by what you all have done and would love to do and, and, and surf and uh, compete at your level. So how does it feel to actually surf in all these competitions? Chaka, Chaka. Chaka. Chaka Brada, is you there, Chaka? Oh, he's got some, having some audio issues. Give him just a second, folks. All right, all right. On you. Oh, I guess you guys are all looking at my mouth. And here, moving around. Yeah, man. Still can't hear it, Chaka. You know, I've got the opportunity to surf with Chaka for quite a while doing the, the WSA circuit and everything else. And he does always bring a great vibe to the beach and just to, and the name of his organization couldn't be more aptly named Stoke uh, for Life because he's Stoke always Life, so, uh, at all the events he competes in. Can you, you guys know, hear me now? We can hear you now, but he always gives it at all. Go ahead, brother. Hold on. Hold on. I got to turn did, this did mic you, off. Did you hear the question, Chaka? I, I did hear the question. Okay, good, good. Thank you, bro. Am I echoing on you guys? A little bit. No, not too bad. Trying to figure out how to work this other mic, but it's not working. Whoa, 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 the whoa, feedback, bro. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No, sorry, man. I'm sorry about that, guys. Hold on. This mic is supposed to be able to mute, but it's not doing that. Get out of the cage, bro. Hold on. So yeah, when you see when you see these guys on their wave skis, it's it's always amazing. The guys like Spike and Chaka and Chris Oberly and all them, they just charge. And we had Kyle on uh, just a couple weeks ago, you know, and he's you know catching stuff out there in Hawaii. It's you know thirty foot over his head. So it's pretty insane. So, yes, yeah, uh, amazing photos. Yeah, and you know, Chaka is never backs down from any opportunity to catch a big wave. So he's always a fun fun guy to to go out for a session with. So, Chuck, you working? Can you guys hear me now? 
We can hear got you now. Good. Sounds good. All right, cool. I think I got it all worked out. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, no worries, man. No worries. Oh, good. It happens. Um, okay, so uh, the question was, how does it feel to compete in all those events? And I want to say hi to you guys, and thanks for including Stoke for Life on this. This is an awesome opportunity. Tommy's one of my biggest heroes, man, one of the people that um, inspire me to, you know, to do what we do for our military, and, and so do you, Dana, and all the, uh, you know, I just want to thank all the vets for, for, uh, for what you guys do. Um, it's a, that's a big mouthful when you guys go over all the events and that's, you know, that's just a small portion of the events I did. So um, some of the highlights of those events were, you know, a couple of things that nobody's ever done um, in a, in a wheelchair um, battle of the paddle. Uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan Levinson was actually the first disabled person to do battle of the paddle. I was actually the first paraplegic to ever do an open water paddleboard race. So that was something that actually changed my life um, with that opportunity. The sub community was very accepting and, and very, uh, you know, very awesome where they just, you know, they embraced me. Um, and, and that trickled down to the surf and, and you know, guys like Steve Bainey and, and Chris Overly and Mark Thornton and those guys kind of got me on the road to, to competing. So, um, you know, I've just, I've been fortunate to, to fall into a, the adaptive water sports uh, genre at, just at the right time, I think, you know, and, and it was a good time for Stoke for Life to be born. A lot of people wanted to know how to get on a paddleboard, how to do open water paddling, how to, you know, how to get on a wave ski, where, how do I get one shaped? What does it look like? Who do I talk to? Um, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Fortunately I've, you know, I've been blessed by God and he's given me a lot of great people to support me. And um, that's why I'm able to introduce people to Dave Dom and, you know, people like Steve Bainey and, you know, I, I got introduced to those guys. So it's not, it's not a gift. Did you feel like you had a lot of pressure on you being, being the first and having so many people um, looking at, you know, looking at you trying to do this and wanting to do it. I mean, you've had to feel some kind of responsibility or, or, or pleasure or pressure in, in this whole developing, you know, paddling and getting out in the ocean and everything. I know you're sure. being looked at by millions. Sure. I, I, I mean, I don't want to say, yeah, I don't want to say that there was any pressure. Um, you know, I just, I do feel a responsibility to pass the information forward. Um, the things that the boards that we've developed, you know, the, the paddle board that me and Dave developed, the open water paddle board, um, it's something that nobody's ever done. Uh, so, uh, you know, those designs, the step rail wave ski, those designs that Dave did pretty much first, um, we yeah. want to be able to pass those forward to everybody. It's not, it's not a secret to keep, you know, it's, it's information that's, that you're that I feel obligated to share so that's that's where my pressure comes in is I feel obligated to to share this with the community I feel obligated to elevate other adaptive athletes that that want to be elevated and say hey how do I get to that level I it's love that I mean I, I can see that yeah, yeah I think what you're you know, doing is awesome so I appreciate sticking with that. Wave skis, do you do you recommend that other adaptive surfers um I mean do you recommend those with other uh, with other adaptive servers with your same co uh, conditions and why? Um, it just depends speed? on how they feel. I mean, for me and a lot of there's a lot of other adaptive surfers that feel like um, that feel like wave ski isn't isn't surfing to them. They feel like prone surfing is surfing to them. Um, I myself, if you can see that picture right there, that's yes. why I feel like a wave ski is surfing. I'm smashing the lip right there. It's like oh, there's no uh, doubt. You know, so is, to me, amazing. I, yeah, I surfed, you know, for years before my accident. So for me to be able to get vertical on a wave ski or pull into a barrel, um, you know, do a sweeping bottom turn into a big cut back off the white water, those are surf maneuvers to me. So, um, so I agree. I mean, I, I mean, as a surfer that never wave ski, I find it totally impressive to see Doug or anybody on a wave ski pull off the maneuvers they do. Um, make the tightest bottom turns, you know, getting into bear. It's, it is amazing. There's, there's nothing like it. I mean, I, I've got to ad admit it is fun to watch and, and it seems like quite the adrenaline, uh, adrenaline rush. Yeah, so you're I mean, the founder of, of Stoke for Life in the U S adaptive open. How do you think adaptive surfing changes lives for those living with lifelong conditions? So that's a tricky question. Um, obviously, water therapy changes people's lives. That's, there's no doubt about that. Now, competitive adaptive surfing is a whole different thing because you have to have a different mindset. Um, it's, not, 
it's not easy to compete with the hungry guys that are on any level or any division of adaptive surfing because they've all and this is maybe not the way to answer it i don't know but they've all in a certain way feel that they've had a level of competitiveness taken from them and now that we've got this platform they're super hungry to get back to it you know what i mean so when they have the opportunity to compete at the u.s open or the hawaiian adaptive surfing championships or amp surf para surfing championships they're ready you know what i mean and they're hungry and they're ambitious and they're you know so uh it's, it's not an easy thing to to go into that arena and go oh i'm gonna come surf here you know and compete you you have to have the mindset of a monster and be like be ready to be beat down or be ready to to elevate you know you have to be ready to 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 compete with guys like tommy with guys like me or jeff munson or chris overly or you know the guys that i compete against and women i can you know i've had to compete against elena nichols for years and she's a monster like she whoops the boys' ass on a regular, and that's her thrill. The more she can kick a guy's butt, the the more elevated she is. She's like, you know, that, that's that's you know a victory for the entire sport when you look at it because she's not only elevating our sport, but she's elevating women's sports as well by beating up on the boys. And she's given the the women the opportunity to dream about that too. Hey, if she can do it, we can do it. You know what I mean? So. Agree. For, for us to be able to create a platform like the U.S. Open, which to me is is a professional adaptive surf event, um, that, you know, it's uh, it, you know we pay out we paid out sixty thousand dollars in cash the last three years, um, and it, it's something that you know I didn't do by myself. You know, people call me right. the creator. It was a great idea, but Mo Johnson, without Dr. Mo Johnson, without my brother, without Colin Renner. Um, you know, I, I don't do this alone. I have a giant team of people behind me that are experts in everything that they do. Dr. Mo Johnson helped me co-create the, the classification system that trickled down from, from us to Hawaii to the, I, I you know, the Parasurf ISA is using it now. So um, what that did is that created unity in the community of, of the division. So it all looks the same from event to event. And that's really important for, for judging across the board for scoring across the board, for athletes to feel like they have a fair and even playing field across the board. When they go to an event, they go, okay, the guys that I'm surfing with, I'm, I'm from, they're, they're surfing the same that I'm surfing. There's no crossing of divisions, you know, and, and so it just creates a more fair playing field and it gives everybody more opportunity to elevate as an athlete. Thank you. Thank you for pro athletes like you to, to definitely carve out what's, what's to come and to make it even for, for everybody to understand. And, and I think that, I think having a playing field that everybody understands, I think is far more important than try to figure out what each country or each organization is doing. Now, not everybody has the same, you know, tools that, that you have available to you and, and you're writing wave skis, which causes a whole different dynamics of, of going underwater. Well, how do you, how do you train and not how do you train? How would you say, for people with the same kind of um, um, conditions that you have, how would you recommend they they train? Because I know that you've been trained by pros, and I, and I'm, but I'm sure you've found adaptive ways to train through that, you know, by yourself. Or um, can you answer any questions like that? Sure. Um, I mean, for me, again, I'm fortunate to have a giant team of people behind me. But the thing that I did to train to do, let's say harbor to harbor which was an open water paddle in the ocean from dana point harbor to oceanside harbor the only people that i know that have ever done that have been elite paddle boarders like chuck glenn and you know ultimate waterman challenge guys you know that are that are super gnarly and i thought well if you know if those guys can do it and, and an adaptive athlete can do something like that um you know the then the it's you know it's limitless what we can accomplish so to train to do that I had to cross train and I had to you know, ride my hand bike. I had to surf, I had to open water paddle, and then I'd go to the gym, medicine ball ropes, kettlebells, different things to do that. And, and it's not, you know, if you're doing all three or all four of those things, you're only doing two of them or three of them a week. You're not doing every single, I mean, you can overload yourself and do it all that, you know, but if you do it in moderation and you do it, um, you're going to gain tremendous, you know, in visualization, I'll be honest with you to, to paddle 27, 28 miles in the open water 
um, take nine hours on the open water. It was something I had to visualize for two years. You know, I surf Oceanside Harbor and that's where I was going to end up. So to paddle out through the harbor and go surf and then paddle in and visualize, what am I going to feel like after paddling 26, 27 miles, after being on the water for eight, nine hours at a time? What's it going to feel like when I come here? So every time I surfed the harbor for two years, when I paddled in, I paddled in with the mindset of how, how am I going to feel after paddling this, this giant paddle? How's that? So visualization is a, is a big thing to me. If you can think it, if you can dream it, if you can do it, if you can, if you can, you know, put it in your mindset, I'm going to accomplish this. This is what, you know, and then ask yourself, how's that going to feel? What am I, how am I going to handle that? How am I going to, you know, there's a lot of questions you're already going to answer before you even get there. So when I paddled into the Harbor after that nine hours, I'd already visualized that a thousand times. So, wow. you know, when the actual moment happened, it, it didn't feel like, you know, a certain amount of me felt like, Oh, this is a great thing. But also I was ready for it. And I was already like, okay, I was already, I've already thought about this and this is how I feel. And, and this is what I expect. So um, visualization is a great thing too. So not only the physical part of, of doing these things to get you there, there's a mental preparation that you have to have to accomplish these things and you have to be ready for it. And that's, that's on every level. If you're just going to get in the water and, you know, maybe you haven't had a great experience in the water. So it's going to take some people to give you confidence in the water. When you get confidence in the water, it gives you a better quality of life. These are all things that are like a ripple effect. Um, so if your mindset can be strong as well as your physical set, um, then you're, you're way ahead of the game. And it's kind of a puzzle piece. You know, you put that physical part together, you put that mental part together, and then you get the big picture. So I think, uh, yeah, all your focus and training, Definitely has paid off. Um, 2014 in your battle, the paddle, um, Laird Hamilton paid you uh, one heck of a compliment. Um, I was watched a little bit of an interview, and and um, he said that of that battle of the paddle, you were the winner of them all. <laughs> you saw that clip. That's great. I did, man. That was so uh, awesome. That's yeah, so, I mean, you know, in Laird Hamilton, he's done it all, and. And you are that layered hammer. You're doing it all and you're inspiring, you're impressing. And, and I think that's what the world needs. So what can Am Surf, Stoke for Life and other groups and organizations do better and share the stoke of adaptive surfing and, uh, and work together to promote this as a therapy? Wow. Um, well, I appreciate that. that. Yeah, Laird, um, you know, coming out of the water at Battle of the Paddle and having a guy like Laird Hamilton come up to me and say, you know, that's the most inspiring thing he'd ever seen. I wasn't ready for that. And, and it freaked me out. And I, I got in my car and cried for 15 minutes and I left, you know, because Laird is, is to me, when I got in my accident, I, I watched a movie called To, T-O. And if you guys haven't seen it, it's produced by Oxbow. And it's a movie that Laird produced um, years and years ago. And it's a documentary about the first tow-in crew to go to Chopu. And it was Laird on a huge day when nobody had ever towed in at Chopu. And it showed how he trained to do it. And he showed when he got there, um, you know, and he took off on three giant waves at the time. They were the biggest waves that had ever been ridden at Chopes. And, uh, and when he got done, he went to the back of the boat and he cried. And, and all of his crew didn't even come near him. He, he, they just, they saw his moment and they left him alone and, and he cried. And that's exactly the moment that Laird gave me when he walked up to me at BOP. And I shared that with him. I said, look, dude, I've been watching this Joe movie for, for years. And it inspired me to get in the water after I'd had my accident. And he didn't, he didn't know that, you know, and then years later, I got to go to, to Laird's house and, and do an interview with him and, and meet his wife and sit in his living room and chat with him. And the things that we can do better as, as, um, individual foundations and organizations is exactly what we're doing now is, is what AMP surf did with, with ISA and which what the ISA did for, for their event and what's what Hawaii's doing with their events, developing just the same structure. So events look and feel exactly the same when you go to them, that's part of it. Um, but as an organization on, on lower levels of just like, Hey, shit i don't hear anybody we lost you sorry about that sorry about that you got me excuse me that was me <laughs> yeah you're back no sorry about that 
Um, just sharing information as organizations, sharing techniques, sharing uh, equipment, sharing shapers, um, all of these things are super important. So if I come up with a way, you know, for somebody to serve for, you know, a technique, I'm not going to keep that. I'm going to, and Dane has got a person that needs that help in his organization. Hey, we got this guy that surfs this way and I saw you do, here, here's that information. Here's that shaper. Here's that board. Here's that it's not, again, it's not mine to keep. It's my obligation to pay it forward to everybody. It's so the more that we can, you know, not feel like, Oh, Hey, we're, I'm doing this on my own and our organization is doing this thing. No, man, we're in this thing together and we're a community and it's our, it's our obligation to, to be a community and to be friendly with each other and to, to, you know, pay homage to look, Dana just did something. Amp surf just did something that that nobody else did and that was step up be a title sponsor for the for the isa parasurfing world championships now if amp surf doesn't do that who does it maybe that event doesn't happen so for amp surf to jump into that arena and go you know what i'm gonna put i'm gonna dip my foot in here and i'm gonna get into competitive adaptive surfing and we're gonna we're gonna test it out as a sponsor well, that, that gave us a whole platform to be able to perform. So for them to be able to step in and do that, um, it, it was a great thing. So, you know, just sharing the information. If Dana said, hey, Chaka, I have a question about how to do this at a contest. What do you guys do? I wouldn't keep that information from him. I would share it with him and say, hey, we do this, Dana, and maybe this might work for you. So um, on that note, it's just share, be open, be, you know, transparency to me is the biggest thing about having a nonprofit, about running surf camps, about running surf events. Um, it's transparency, man. Just, just share and, and uh, feel the camaraderie and the brotherhood. Well, sticking with the, with the, uh, with the aloha of sharing, what would be two things that you would tell a beginning adaptive surfer uh, that is considering picking up surfing or especially even an adult um, wanting to pick up some adaptive surfing, what would you do or what would you say to help them on their way? Two things. I, you know, I would say, um, A, make sure that you're, if you're a beginner, look, man, the water's a dangerous place, man, and you have to have a lot of respect for it. I mean, if you can see this picture, there's a set I'm taking off on, but there's a twice as bigger set behind it. And I remember this wave because it was at the U.S. Open. And once I cut out of that wave, I took the other wave behind it right on my head. And I got washed 100 yards down the beach. So if you're going to get into it in the water, make sure that you get in with an organization that's got great water crew, that's got great water safety, that's got the ability to give you, again, confidence in the water, gives you better quality of life. So if you go in the water with an organization that's not, that's not schooled, that's not fluent, um, and, and you have a bad – experience what are the chances that you're going to go back to water therapy <laughs> they're pretty small so um, if you get get in there with a good organization that's got good programs it's got good that's got good staff that's got good water crew you're going to have a great experience so just first do your research and and you know make sure that you're getting in with a crew that's that's got a lot of experience in what they're doing and and can steer you in the right way and, and there's a lot of them you know life rolls on uh, amp surf stoke for life access surf um, there's, you know, walk on, uh, walk on water, waves for all. There's, there's a ton of organizations that are, that are doing this and that can help you and that have good crews and that have good technique and good people that, that can give you a good experience. You just have to do a little bit of research and reach out to a couple of people. I'm so thankful hey. to have so many freaking pros here that have so much information because you've answered, uh, pretty much the next question. If you wanted to hey. add anything to it, what hey. do you expect that? Guys, we got a. Um, sorry, uh, Dennis, but we got a. We're, we're over by about ten minutes, and so I apologize, but we're going to have to cut this short. Uh, Chaka, I, I, dude, huge kudos, and thank you for being here, and I, I do apologize, guys, for having to cut it short. No, uh, we're sorry, my audio. No, no worries. Through, no uh, worries. We got some, we, just, we got some other speakers, <laughs> but just to uh, go. Uh, I, I'll take the blame on that. I thought yeah. we were on Pacific time and Dana called me. It was like, dude, where are you at? And I'm like, I thought I was on at 1230. Like it's Eastern yeah. time. So yeah. my bad. Uh, no worries. Time, no my worries. Bad, hey, we, it seems to be the theme of the day. We've been having te technical difficulties all morning. So it's not, it's not all on you, bro. No worries at all. Hey, thanks again, Chaka, for everything you're doing uh, with Stoke for Life and, and, and the contest, the uh, U.S. Adaptive Open. I, I know I'm honored to be a part of all of it and, 
and stuff. Uh, up next, we're going to have Jace Wheeler come on. But before we we do that, um, anybody at any time, anyone needs to take a break. By all means, you're you're you're. No one has to sit here the entire time. By all means, take get up, take a bath break, do whatever you got to do, eat your lunch and uh, what whatnot. Uh, so we're going to skip the break. Uh, but I did want to quickly uh, introduce uh, Steve from Hope for the Warriors. Uh, I think he's up and live. Uh, and uh, have him just say a couple words, if you would, please, Steve. Uh, Steve, are you there, brother? He's muted. He's muted. I see that. Hey, Dana, I just you. wanted to say thanks for having me, man. I love you guys, and uh, you guys are awesome. So, oh, thank you. Love you. Thank you, Chuck. Stick around if you can. We'd love to love to have you um, stick around with us if you can. Hey, Steve, right on, I see you've unmuted. So, uh, Steve, want to say a quick hello and just give us a, 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 a one-minute uh, – blast for uh hopeful warriors yeah uh so first off thank you to everybody for being on here dana thanks for you know putting all this together and doing this um you know it's it's been awesome working with you over the years um and so for anybody who doesn't know hope for the warriors uh we're an organization that does a bunch of different things um so we work with uh post 9 11 era veterans in uh, in sports and rec uh, so we do events like this uh we do hunting fishing kayaking hiking uh we also do some of uh some of the endurance programs that some folks may have seen out there too like uh different marathons and hand cycling and, and all that um and then uh, we also actually put on a run series we're doing that virtually uh this year uh you know for obvious reasons um and then you know we have clinical social workers on staff who work directly with folks get them to resources in their own communities. Uh, we also provide some counseling and then we do transition services too. So uh, we've been doing all that since 2006, uh, started aboard Camp Lejeune uh, down in Jacksonville, North Carolina. And uh, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been amazing working here over the last seven years uh, in sports and rec, but we definitely provide a lot of things outside of sports and rec also. So if you guys or anybody you know are looking for those types of services, you know, we would definitely love to, to meet you and uh, connect with you. All you have to do is go to the website and, and uh, there's an apply for services tab. Just hit that and uh, you can get started and we'll have somebody get in contact with you. And again, Dana, thank you so much for having us, you know, providing this information and putting this together. It's uh, it's, it really is amazing, and uh, and we're just uh, grateful to be here. Uh, thanks, Steve. We appreciate it very much. Hey, Steve, if you could, uh, I know tonight there is a the so the Rockway Warriors Weekend is put on by the Rockway War uh, the Rockway Warriors Weekend organization and the and the uh, Breezy Point Cooperative, and uh, they're hosting a virtual concert tonight to raise money for Hope for the Warriors. So. Steve, if you could uh, share that via the chat, that uh, the information for the for the concert. So if you guys want to enjoy a, a great concert, it's free to join the concert. If you want to donate, you can. Um, I know Steve's going to be saying a few words at the, at the event uh, and everything. So that's tonight. Uh, Steve, what time is that at? Uh, the concert is at 8.30. And that's Eastern Standard Time, right? right. East Coast Time? Okay. That's for you, Chaka, if you're still on there, brother. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so yeah, guys, if you can join that concert tonight, uh, Steve will share that info with everybody, and then uh, uh, and we'll uh, we can all enjoy that as well. Uh, so hey, up next, we're gonna have uh, Jason Wheeler is gonna come on, uh, be our next guest speaker, and he's gonna be getting interviewed by our uh, New England chapter uh, rep and board member uh, Steve Cabernier. So Steve, uh, if you want to take that over, I will start uh, Jason's slideshow. Thanks. I will. Can everyone hear me? Good. Yes. Yes. Um, first of all, um, Jace, am I interviewing Jace or am I interviewing Justice? Because uh, <laughs> if you all can see Justice sitting right in front of Jace. How you doing? Good, brother. How are you doing? Great, great. So let me just read, uh, obviously, a little bio of it uh, for you. Uh, Jace Wheeler first joined the military as a fighter, a firefighter aboard USS John F. Kennedy aircraft carrier during the Gulf War. And then after the 9-11 terror attacks, uh, Jace made the decision to serve again and re-enlisted uh, in the U.S. Army in the 509th Airborne Infantry Recon Unit Team 2. 
Uh, then in 2002, uh, during a statewide training exercise in very unfavorable weather conditions, uh, Jace jumped out of a uh, Black Hawk helicopter at 1,500 feet, about 250 feet from the ground. Uh, he experienced a parachute malfunction. Uh, he was unable to cut away the chute and it was uh, wrapped around him. And then at about 50 feet from the ground, he had no support from any of his equipment and hit the ground full force. Um, this injury caused many debilitating injuries, including traumatic brain injury, uh, rod damage in both his eyes, and ultimately caused the loss of both his legs. Uh, today, Jace is a master mason and also a shriner and looks for any opportunity to serve others. Uh, this includes helping kids with disabilities, and he's also an ambassador with uh, organization Operation Pay It Forward, a nonprofit organization that ensures his military brothers and sisters continue to enjoy life-changing outdoor experiences with their families. So, uh, Jace, first question for you. Uh, Thank you, first of all, for being with us in this event, and thank you for your service and sacrifice to your very thankful nation. Um, please tell us more about why you re-enlisted after 9-11. Okay, um, I re-enlisted after 9-11. I had a nine-year break in service. I'm from New Hampshire. Um, when you make it big time, you either move to Boston or you move to New York City. So I had brothers and sisters that I was actually with in the, um, through high school that were at the towers, uh, the North and the South Tower. And after when that happened, and that happened to um, FDNY losing 343, 23 police officers, um, I felt a great bond to go either help New York City to become a firefighter or to serve back in our military. And I felt like at 32 years old that uh, the young guys couldn't catch me. I felt like I was still young enough to get in the game. So that's why I re-enlisted and went back in again. Nice. Thank you for doing that, for sure. Um, so you've participated in a number of Amp Surf events throughout the years on the East Coast. And I, I think you met my daughter, I think it was uh, about six years ago at uh, one of the Breezy events. And uh, also went out to California and surfed with the West Coast. Um, what do you think it is about surf therapy from a healing perspective for you and others who try it. Surfing is like what the other gentleman was talking about before. There's like four different phases that you you see those waves, but with surfing, it's just like life. All of a sudden you're going to be on top of that wave and then you wiped out and you're having a bad day. You may be in a lot of pain, but you got to get back on that board again. You got to keep on pushing forward. You got to keep on doing it. You know, um, that life it struggles that you have. Yeah, it teaches you how to change your angles and change your approach through life. And that's how you go through like um, the difference between, you know, uh, adjusting to get into a chair or adjusting into seeing that wave. You just look differently and that helps your, uh, your mental state of uh, where you are and, and your physical being. So that's a great perspective. The empty surf can help out guys that are able body or girls able body and guys that are amputees because it'll teach you how to go through um, your life and do different perspectives of it. Well, thanks for sharing that. That's that's insightful. Um, so we've seen you riding horseback. Can you share other sports that you're into? Um, right now, um, uh, I do the Highland Games. I'm not sure if you know what the Highland Games are, but it's a Scottish event. And um, I'm an adaptive athlete for that. I'm actually uh, number one in the world, but I always picture myself as number five, you know, and mm -hmm. I got to keep on going better than the guys that stand up and throw. So I uh, got into that, got into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and um, nice. we got a tournament coming up here in a couple weeks. That's always fun. You know, I like going against the guys that are the black belts that are a little bit better than me, faster than me, stronger than me. Um, I'm always up for a challenge. You know, uh, we just went and um, hiked Colorado um, a few weeks ago, and um, I'm always up for a challenge and pushing myself, trying to go forward. Um, you know, with, with Operation Pay Forward, it's always a hand up to me. You know, I'm never looking for a handout, so you always try and serve and try and help people out. Uh, we do cattle drives that go anywhere between 
um, 10 hours at a 4,300 feet all the way up to uh, 9,800 feet, bringing down a couple head of cattle. Um, sitting on a horse with no legs is a pretty scary situation. <laughs> and, uh, it's like anything in life. You just keep on pushing yourself further and further, you know, to keep on doing well. And, you know, I, I'm very thankful for, for Amp Surf, you know, Hopeful Warriors, the Gary Seas Foundation that does it, and also the Breezy Co-op, you know. And I don't know if anybody realizes this or not, but FDNY and NYPD, these guys actually take vacation time to actually take care of us, which – they're giving this to you. It is a gift. And that's absolutely the most breathtaking thing when somebody can give you a gift of their time because your time is the most important out of everything. Well, you know what? That kind of goes right to one of my next questions. But, uh, you know, can you share with some of the other people here on, uh, on the call um, and obviously the fellow veterans um, about the feeling of amp surf and hope for the warriors and that whole rockaway warrior weekend and really what you get out of that weekend because you know i've experienced it and it is like nothing i've i think people would experience anywhere else in the world it just for some reason that community is just absolutely incredible it certainly is and with that community, it's actually, it actually turned me into moving to Breezy and Rockaway just because all the community does for you. You have all the gray beards that are out there with Rockaway. You have all the volunteers, and these are retired police officers, firefighters, wives, kids. These guys are all giving you their time. Um, where can you go to one of the biggest cities in the United States and they actually shut down the Verrazano Bridge for wounded warriors? Where does that happen? Where you yeah, go? I know. And you see every on and off ramp, we have police officers and everybody saluting you. I mean, that is just a, a thing that every veteran, in my opinion, needs to experience. Um, I, I, I've been blessed, and I think I've been doing it now with Dana. I don't know, man. I think it's been like 15 years or something. And um, it, it, it always gets better and better. You can push that guy or girl that's, you know, a little bit hesitant to get involved with uh, a team again and then you get brought into a team which was you know it's it's absolutely amazing it's like the same thing when um we get like you mentioned tommy nest you know and then you have the amp surf team you know and, and going through that thing with uh with katie it's i i think it feels like 10 years ago you know teaching me how to do it and having my dog there and you know making um, me a part of your life and i'm a part of your life going through this and it is the best time that anyone can ever have going out to Hope of the Warriors and spending three or four days with my heroes. You know, FDNY, NYPD, uh, those guys are just like guys that are in the infantry and you go into battle, they go into battle of fire every, every day, you know? So um, it's, it's incredible. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it did. Know. And you know what? The com camaraderie between both the FDNY and the NYPD and their scheduling and precision is, is that weekend is just crazy how, how, how powerful it is. Yeah, it certainly is. And like, you know, I went through limb salvage for both of my legs for like 13 years. Uh, I flatlined three times, been in ICU for um, up to three months. And when I was getting my legs amputated, I believe it was back in, 2015, I actually had, um, uh, Mike Clifford is one of the guys that do, do the boat thing with us. And uh, from, from Rockaway, FDNY, he actually came down to Charleston, spent the night down there when I had my legs amputated and went back the next day. Those guys and girls are dynamite and they're still ones that I call up today when I'm going through issues with, um, this COVID has been very, very hard on me. Um, you know, we have, we have uh, Nicholas that's in a wheelchair, he can't walk or he can't talk. And yeah. being able to rely on my battle buddies and being able to talk to them has helped me because I lost four good friends in this last four or five months. It's just been really, really tough. And mm -hmm. we need to get that. back out there again. And that, that's what, you know, God made us to serve. And like Dana does it. And, you know, um, Steve Barto, Hopeful Warriors does it. And uh, it's, um, it's a beautiful thing. It certainly is, and sorry about your friends. Um, so do you think others living with limb loss and other conditions could benefit from trying surfing uh, with Amp Surf or 
other sports that you do? I, I definitely believe in it. You know, I, I love to surf. And that guy, um, Chaka, that was talking earlier, you know, I mean, hey, I, that, that row thing, I, I would love to challenge him. I, I would love to do that. I mean, there, there are so many things. Like, I go out and I'll do a marathon. You know, mm-hmm. I, I'll go over here and I'll do something else. And I'm like, I've never done that thing before. But it's like, you know what? Um, I'm not afraid of it. I'm going to take it on. And, I, and I'm just going to go with it. Because, you know, truly life is a blessing. You know, and we've been given this life and this opportunity. And you guys, like everyone pretty much calls it a sacrifice. You know, I lost both of my legs, you know, above the knee, legally blind. I'll never drive another day in my life, you know. And I have a hard time kind of visualizing people when they're walking in and stuff. You know, so, but I, but I take that as a gift and I try and pass it on to the kids and try and teach the kids, you know, this different outlook that I have now, you know, that I, I never would have had before if I didn't have this traumatic brain injury, can't remember when to take my meds and, you know, it, you know, it's just, uh, Amp Surf, Dana knows, you know, he got me off of um, taking 33 different pills a day, you know, medication, yeah. you know, um, that's a lot. And, and, and it's helped me get, you know, myself a different perspective because it's like, you know, Hey, I can do this. Well, I can do this too. And I, and I, and, and Dana knows we already got one of my other friends um, that's going through a really hard time struggling with life. And, you know, we're going to get him involved in the amp surf and get him out there. And he's an able body ranger. And, uh, but you know, everybody goes through their little struggles in life. You know, we, we all do. Well, you know what? Um, I think it's your badass uh, mentality that you have, but uh, can you share, you know, doing all these different things that you, you know, you've never done before. Uh, I'm sure you faced adversity and, you know, what keeps you driving forward? You know, it's it, all it takes is heart. And, you know, where you want to take everybody is I'm the guy on the bottom of the mountain and I'm going to bring us all up to the top of the mountain because we, we all, there's a, there's a greater view there's a bigger purpose in life and you got to bring them all up to the top, you know, and I'm just a person about bringing, bringing everybody up there to, to share what we're doing. You guys have shared, you know, the surfing with me and now I love it. I try and push everybody towards it. It's just like anything in life, you know, it, it just takes heart. You know, you got 60% drive. I've gone through what Dana's known. I, you know, I've been a world strong man benching 500 pounds and then I'll hurt my back and I couldn't even lift more than 20 pounds. Hmm. And now I got to get myself back into shape again, you know, and even though I'm 49, I still feel like I'm, you know, 32 when I got hurt, <laughs> you know, my mentality is just totally different. Well, that's, it's an inspiration and uh, I'm happy to see you happy to see justice uh, say hello to Christy for us. And we really appreciate um, you being with us. And again, of course, thank you for your service and pleasure, pleasure talking with you. And you know what, we'll open up uh, maybe some questions, Dana. If anyone yeah, has if any anyone's got any, yeah, if anyone's got any questions for Jace, go ahead and uh, have at it. Jace, John Roberts from the Rockaway Beach Breezy Point chapter of AM Surf. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. I had Nicholas speaking. <laughs> sorry. It's John Roberts from the Rockaway Beach Breezy Point chapter. Oh, Roger that. Yeah, good. Uh, did you say you live in Breezy Point? I lived in Breezy Point two years. I lived on Roosevelt Walk, and I also lived um, in Rockaway. Uh, we were down in uh, really tall buildings. I can't remember if that's... Shorefront uh, Parkway, yes. 106 or whatever that's yeah. called? Yeah, that's yeah. Shorefront Parkway, yeah. Are you still Are you still down there on the peninsula? Uh, no, I actually uh, moved to uh, Texas. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I go way back with Amp Surf when we used to work with the Wounded Warriors, and I do remember you, and uh, you, uh, you're a great inspiration to uh, everybody. And if you're ever up in New York, give me a, a shout out, John at AmpSurf.org. I definitely will, brother. We'll be seeing you soon. Probably this fall, we'll be up there. Very hey, good. Don't hey, hesitate. Jace, Jace, I wanted to ask a question. Dane, I wanted to ask just a quick question, because I know you're... Um, one or two of your kids are, are, are autistic as well. And so, you're, you know, you're, you're, you've got your condition and stuff, and you're also raised, you and uh, your wife are raising, you know, children with autism and stuff like that. Would you just share, like, what that's like and, a little bit and, and just, you know, if, if you think that surfing is something good for, for him as well? 
Oh, yeah. N Nicholas has what they call Angelman syndrome. And basically, he's, he's 18 years old. He can't walk or he can't talk. Um, but he understands. He makes like these little, you know, ah, ah, different noises, tells us. And he has a, uh, the Angelman syndrome that they have a deal with uh, touching. So um, the water is like huge for him. And I, I would give anything to get him, you know, out there in the ocean, out there on a the board. Um, you know, and have them go through that, you know, with you guys, because, you know, in our life, I, I just feel like the, the children are the biggest, you know, gains that you can teach these guys. And Nicholas. That's Nicholas there in the picture, right? Yeah, yeah, little copper. You know, I yeah. call him copper because his, his red hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, he's just the best kid ever. And um, we end up being like, I think it's like the great barrage. Because, you know, I got just a service dog. I got no legs. And then there's Nicholas in a wheelchair. And everyone's always thankful, you know, when they come home and they're like, hey, man, our family, we have no problems. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> it's, just, it's just this beautiful thing. And, I, you know, I, I wouldn't change it. You know, I wouldn't yeah. change it. Yeah. I hear you. There you go. Anyone else got a question for Jace? All right. Hey, Jace, thank you so much again for being here with us today and sharing uh, not only you know about your experiences, but about your family and and everything. It's it's always an honor, it's in, in person or or virtual. Um, I know you are a, a big inspiration for me, and, and I couldn't agree with you more. What you're saying about um, you know people should be thankful for, you know, the blessings that they have in their lives, because it doesn't matter what, what is going on in your life. There's somebody out there that's, that's struggling hard or dealing with something that's a little harder. And, and yeah. we are all blessed to, to have the, what we have. And, and we should, we should look at more to that instead of the problems that we have, I think. So, and you, and you, you ooze that uh, ability to not focus on the, on your problems, but to focus on your abilities, which is one of our amp surf's, you know, mottos. And, and you, you truly live that. And we thank you. And, and just my last point before we switch over is I'll see you in those Highland games. I want to do that too. That sounds awesome. Oh brother, you got to try. Awesome. <laughs> hey, up next, we've got, uh, thanks, Jace. Trevor, thanks Jace. We've got Trevor Peterson coming up next. Um, and, uh, his team, Norm and Lena, and they're going to share with us about, uh, doing SUP, which is one of the things we teach at the Rockway Warriors weekend event and at our, um, at some of our other events. So, uh, Trevor, I'm going to turn this over to you. And if you are ready to go, I'm going to start your, uh, presentation for you and you guys can jump on, uh, you, Lena and Norm. Hey there. We hear you brother. Okay. I'm not sure what just happened, but I've lost the whole, uh, we can hear you just fine. Okay, here we are. Yeah, I see what's going on now. Yeah, we're just switching things over here, making you the spotlight and putting on the, the your presentation. Cool. Uh, hey, my name's Trevor Peterson. I work with Amp Surf as the uh, stand-up paddleboard instructor. Today, joining me will be uh, paddleboarders Lina Augustus Augusti, I think, and Norm Han. If they want to say hello, chime in there. Hey, everyone. <laughs> okay. So uh, a quick introduction about myself. I, uh, I have been paddle boarding for about 10 years now. Uh, I'm a flat water instructor, and I have my surf coastal touring and whitewater certificates. Uh, I have done two supported uh, expeditions to raise awareness for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'm currently a brand ambassador for Warner Paddles and Nikki Reichman Sales. Uh, Lynn, if you want to introduce yourself and then Norm. Hi, I'm Lynn Algaitis. Um, and uh, I've been stand-up paddleboard racing for about 10 years. I've won a couple world championships and uh, most recently went to the Pan Am Games. And also teach stand-up paddleboarding and have taught a lot of clinics um, around the world. Norm. Yeah, I'm, Norm. Uh, I'm Norm. I got a stand-up paddleboard business here in British Columbia. Uh, we do uh, multi-day stand-up paddleboarding trips to, you know, remote places in British Columbia, Belize. I've been an instructor, trainer with Paddle Canada for, yeah, probably 10 years. 
and I, I originally actually got into the into the sport through surfing through paddle surfing I really enjoy surfing and uh, absolutely love uh, the paddle surfing side of things and I've done a number of also personal expeditions just to try and bring awareness to the threat of uh, oil tankers um, in, in our Great Bear Rainforest and uh, conservation expeditions. Cool. When I first got into paddleboarding, I was still struggling with PTSD. Um, the thing that drew me into the sport was uh, I had to be mindful and uh, it's something I couldn't connect with outside of that. So it became meditated and as time's gone on, it uh, really expanded from there. Uh, Lena, what drew, drew you into the sport? Um, for me, I was always looking for new adventures, new excitements. And when paddleboarding was just coming out in Canada, um, I was very curious. And so I wanted to try this new sport. Um, and really, the adventure of it and the community of it, community of people that were surrounding the sport is really what kept me going through the sport. And then I also found that I was quite talented in the sport as well. So that kind of combination of community and talent and um, excitement of a new sport uh, is really what pushed me forward, forward and, and um, to continue in the sport. And um, I just also like, you get to explore such beautiful parts of the world and really being on the water is different than being on the land. So kind of having that experience of exploring um, from the water point of view, uh, most of my past sports have been land sports. So I've really enjoyed um, that, that water aspect. Cool, Norm, you wanna tell us what drew you into the sport? Yeah, sure. I, uh, I grew up on the lakes of Northern Ontario, uh, canoeing and, and spending a lot of time there fishing. I was a high school teacher and then ended up moving out west of British Columbia to get all of my guiding certification. So I was a sea kayak guide for a number of years. And then when stand up paddleboarding first came in, I got really excited about the sport. I, again, I actually saw it from the surfing side of things. So I saw Laird Hamilton charging on this board. Um, and it, to me, it seemed to be this amazing combination of, of paddling, which I already enjoyed with the canoeing and the sea kayaking and then surfing, which I, I absolutely love. And so I thought it was a beautiful marriage of two sports for me. And that's what sort of brought me into the sport. But since I had already had a guiding background on our coastline, it, I found that it was a really incredible tool for connection to the water. And, and that sort of led me to uh, you know, building programs and doing multi-day trips where I have the opportunity to connect people to wild places. Well, those are both awesome stories. Uh, so let's get a look at uh, what a beginner would, uh, excuse me, need to know getting into the sport. So, Lina, what's the best way to successfully try the sport out? Um, really doing some research, um, getting to uh, a style of water that suits your comfort level. So generally getting in um, a calmer water will lead to more success. And then uh, kind of being on the correct equipment um, suited for your level of fitness and comfort. And then it's always very helpful to have some instruction when you get out and getting out with other people, um, I think are some really valuable um, things to look for. Cool, thanks, Lena. Uh, Norm, what would be the best board for a beginner to use? Uh, well, I think initially it's finding something that's stable. Uh, I think to back up prior to that and to echo what Lena is saying is, I think it's really key to find a good instructor uh, to start off with. And that good instructor is really going to give you the skill set that you need, but really help you uh, get into the, the, the equipment that you need as well. And generally those good instructors will have the right gear in a similar way to surfing you're not going to put somebody on a board that's too small where it's going to be a very frustrating experience for them um, so finding that that correct equipment um, and generally yeah finding those boards that are stable and then ideally trying to find oh you know where that i think once people get inspired with the sport then they start to look beyond in terms of what they want to do with that board so you try and find something that's stable for them, that, but that will also be a, a good piece of equipment if they want to tour or if they want to surf 
um, or if they want to head down river. So with, with the multidiscipline aspect of the sport, there's a number of different ways you can go with it. Uh, but initially with flat waters, is getting something that's stable but not too wide because it will affect your forward stroke uh, performance if you have something that's just too wide. Yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. Uh, what would you say is a good paddle for a beginner, Lina, and uh, what would be a, a good way to measure that, like paddle length? Yeah, so a nice way to, I'll just start with the paddle length. Uh, a nice way to measure paddle length um, is to stand up straight, have uh, the blade, blade of the paddle on the ground and uh, raising your, your arm straight up and then just having the handle, I like to have it just, just around the, the wrist length and then from there you can kind of adjust on the type of board you're paddling, the type of water you're paddling and if you have injuries or how, how strong you're paddling. So that's a nice place to start. Um, I really like also to encourage people to start with an adjustable paddle. Um, that way they can really figure out what that length is that suits their, their needs, their body, their um, whatever, yeah, their paddling. Um, and I also really encourage um, to try and, and seek out a, a paddle that is, is strong and light. Um, obviously that, uh, that also is generally a more expensive paddle, but it really is worth it. Um, it just gets that experience, a positive experience out of your initial um, paddling experience and it's just better on your body as well. So if you can kind of find that combination, I think that's really great and you'll really enjoy the sport. Thanks. Uh, now, a leash should be as long as the board you are using. Norm, can you just explain the types of leashes available and the best environments for these leashes? Sure, there's generally three types of leashes that you're gonna find. Well, when the sport first, first started, it came from the surf. So everything sort of looked like, a, the board was like a big surfboard, the paddle lengths were shorter, uh, and then you always had a, a straight leash. So if you're in the surf and you're surfing, your leash has to be at least the same length as your board so that when you wipe out that, that board will clear away from you. But what they found was quickly that the straight leash was an effective leash when you're paddling on flat water. So the second type of leash that you use when you're paddling on flat water, racing or touring is what we call a coil leash. So it's a lot shorter, it doesn't hang in the water, it, it allows you to be a lot more efficient. And then the third type of leash that was developed as the sport continued to grow, people started taking the paddle boards down rivers and so when you get on a river or moving water generally, you don't want to be sort of hardwired or tied into your board. You need a quick release system when you're on the river. So we, we teach a lot of river courses and the third type of leash would be a quick stop, quick, quick release style of leash. And, and those are the three types of leashes that you'll, you'll see. Generally the quick release will attach to your PFD or to a quick release belt. Your coil leash and your surf, straight surf leash are attached to your ankle. Thanks. Uh, safety gear is an important in any sport. In the paddle boarding uh, community, life vests are part of that list. Lena, can you tell us about the different life vests and other safety equipment we uh, use in the sport? Yeah, um, so that you have kind of your, your regular PFD that you would zip up and put around um, your body, which is really great to have and wear and um, you know I think is the most safe and um, you also have uh, inflatable PFDs that can either go around your body or around your waist um, you'll find the inflatable PFDs around your waist really common um, in racers um, and uh, also very very good to wear um, a leash is really, really important. Um, it keeps you attached to your board um, and your board is, is a big flotation device itself. Um, uh, some sort of communication device is really important. So often you'll have a whistle um, attached to your, your life vest or your PFD um, and that allows you to communicate uh, loudly and quickly. Uh, also, if you're on the ocean, a radio is useful. Um, and also just having uh, a phone that is waterproof and a waterproof bag can also be really helpful if you're in um, uh, cell phone range. 
Um, Norm, am I missing anything? I don't think so, but I just want to back up what you said, Lena. I, I, one of the challenges we have in the sport is stand up paddleboarding because it sort of originated from the surf where you, where you didn't wear a surfboard, or sorry, we didn't wear a, a, a PFD. Is is PFDs are are mandatory. So in Canada, they're mandatory. You need a whistle on your PFD, and so you you have to wear a PFD. And if you, if it's hot and you want to wear a waist belt PFD, that's fine, but you have to wear a PFD. Um, as Lena said as well, the leash, uh, as I touched on as well, is probably the cheapest and most important piece of safety gear that you can have because it keeps you attached to the board. And so when you go out, and I'm, I'm always looking at people paddling, do they have a PFD on with a sound signaling device? And are they wearing a leash? And those are the two key ones. And then from there, as Lena said, having some form of communication, what happens if you get into trouble out there? And need to call somebody so we really especially in our courses and i know with what linda teaches we're always really promoting the safety aspect of the sport as it really gets overlooked and it's just oh it's just a surfboard i'll hop on it it's hot i'll, I'll go paddle on the lake no big deal but most of the deaths we've seen in paddleboarding have been a result of people not wearing a leash and they fall off into the water the wind blows their board away and um you know if they're not a strong swimmer or they panic it, it can be over that quickly so um, I'm always pretty serious about the safety side of things, so I'm glad you brought it up, Trev. Lena. Yeah, I, I like I, I I'm a world class athlete in stand up paddle boarding, and I live on a lake. And uh, every single time I go out, I wear I have a whistle, a PFD, and a leash, uh, no matter how hot or how cold it is. And our waters, especially in Canada, are generally very cold, um, which I think is deceiving for a lot of people as well. Oh yeah, I don't go anywhere without a, a PFD. Everything I do is, and I, I see it a lot where people aren't wearing them and I mentioned that. Uh, so quickly, what would you say is a fundamental skill when you're learning, uh, starting to learn paddle boarding? Elena? Um, so being able to get back on your board, <laughs> I think is very important and being comfortable with that. Um, also being able to stop um, so understanding how to control your board and just being comfortable on your board um, is two things that I really um, teach a lot. And just, yeah, your basic forward stroke and, and some turning um, to be, be able to maneuver your board. So um, forward stroke, stopping, some basic turns and um, being able to get back on your board, getting off and on your board. Norm, you got anything to expand on that? Yeah, I just touch on, I think probably one of the most critical skills that takes probably the longest to master is your forward stroke. So again, when you come back to, you know, working with a good teacher, a good instructor, a good coach, they'll, they'll give you the right form. And once you have the right form for your forward stroke, it, it really changes the game, I think, in terms of what you do on your paddleboard. Um, you know, some of the turns, those things you, you learn fairly quickly. Uh, the other thing I may just touch on is learning how to move your feet around on the board. So people have a tendency to just be glued into a square stance. But as you progress in the sport and get into surfing, downwinding, river, you're moving into, you know, from, from square stance to a hybrid stance to a true surf stance. And so just making sure that people are moving around their board, uh, I call it the dance, and, and just having, having fun with that um, are some of the key components. Yes, those are actually the two I constantly work on is my forward stroke and footwork. Yeah. Um, not to say all the others are important because of footwork on your pivot turns and stuff, they all come into play. Um, Lina, as a world-class athlete, uh, what advice would you give to someone who's interested in progressing into racing? Um, yeah. So a lot of the communities, so in our regular uh, pre-COVID, most communities will have um, some sort of community race or community social paddle um, or something like that. So kind of connecting with other people and starting to do those fun socials or fun races. Um, and that from there, you'll kind of learn um, a little bit more about your technique and a little bit more about the equipment as you progress into racing. So the boards tend to get um, lighter and narrower. Um, your paddle tends to get a little bit shorter, um, a little bit lighter, and um, then you start learning a little bit about 
training and fitness. So if there's, uh, you know, anyone running any kind of interval fitness classes um, or any kind of group sessions like that, that's very useful. And then even now there's a, there's a ton of online coaching, um, lots of people providing um, ways to train in order to complete your first two kilometer, five kilometer, 10 kilometer race. Um, and there's lots of, you know, festivals and events that kind of have that combination of a recreational race with competitive race, um, technical race where you go around buoys or a long distance race. And then you can kind of start, start choosing what style you really like or, you know, um, if there's a, a cool uh, venue you would like to go check out or some water that you like to check out, then I think that's a really great way to get get started and and then you're meeting different kinds of people and um and then you just kind of get involved and it spirals to more and more and more and you kind of get hooked <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's how I, I met uh, a lot of the people in in the sport was through the races and it's a great community to to get involved in everyone's happy um norm would you uh, you have mentored me on my expeditions and uh you have numerous under your belt what advice would you give to someone looking into following this particular path? It sort of sound like a broken record here, but uh, I think it's always important to get, you know, to get the proper instruction and education to start to have that foundation uh, of good skills and safety. Then once you've got that, I think from there, I think you need to let your passions take you where, you know, your passions and your goals take you to where you want to go in the sport. And so, as Linda was talking about racing, if racing is your thing and you really enjoy that aspect of it, then great, move there. Uh, if you, you know, want to get into touring and doing multi-day trips and connecting to beautiful coastline and places and wildlife, then, then focus on doing that. And for me, I don't do anything in the sport that doesn't inspire me, that doesn't get me excited, that doesn't get, you know, it gets me up in the morning and gets me going. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about the sport of stand-up paddleboarding is that once you learn it effectively, I just look at the paddleboard as a tool. And it's a, so how do you want to use that tool? And in the same way, surfboard uh, for what you guys are doing is, is, is providing this tool, right? And I think when it comes to the trips and multi-day stuff, Trev, you know, with the trips that you're doing, not only were you inspired and passionate about it, but you're doing it for a bigger cause. And that's what I was doing as well with some of the oil tanker stuff on the coast. So it really comes from that passion and excitement and goals in terms of where you want to go in the sport. And if it's surfing, great. If it's river paddling, uh, let, 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 let your passion sort of take you where you want to in the sport after you've gotten some good safety uh, and instruction. Oh, thanks, Norm. Uh, Lena, there's various disciplines involved in, uh, in the sport, uh, surfing, the whitewater, um, could you explain downwinding to those of us that or those that are not familiar with it? Yeah, I get Norm could probably explain it better, but I'll try a little bit. <laughs> um, my, my forte has always been flat water, but I, I have obviously paddled downwind a lot. Um, and it's a really, it's really, really fun. And I think it's one, one aspect. So downwinding is where you're kind of paddling with either the, with, with the waves, essentially if it's swell, wind, um, and so usually it's a point to point, um, unless you're me and you like paddling into the wind as well. So then you paddle in and then turn around and get the downwind back. So it's kind of like an uphill and then you get to downhill back. Um, and um, so it's point to point, it's obviously exhilarating. Um, and, a, and a really nice thing about downwinding is, um, unlike surfing, you don't really get beaten down by the waves constantly. Um, you get to, you don't get that crazy whitewash all the time um, and obviously safety is so important in downwinding as well I know we're talking about safety a lot so it's really great to downwind with with friends um, and you know when you're downwinding being on the right board to help you out um, so in stand-up paddleboarding there's so many different styles of boards like any like most sports and um, downwinding um, also has that it, it's, it's kind of uh, a certain board style and um, you're, you're following the waves down. So there's a combination of, of surfing. So you're moving your feet a lot. So you're moving forwards, you're moving back. It's 
parallel stance, surface stance. Um, and then you're looking um, to see what the water is doing so that you can maneuver the board to catch your waves, um, to constantly catch, catch the surf and so that eventually really good people, unlike myself, <laughs> um, can just actually surf the whole way and they're not actually paddling very much. So it's a little bit of a combination of a sprint with a surf to get yourself on the wave and um, really understanding what to look for um, in front of you and behind you. Um, and maybe Norm can even expand a little bit on that. But I would say um, really important, I'll, it's really fun and, and, and good for safety to be, to be with other people. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Norm, I know you fished off your uh, your paddle boards. Can you tell us the advantages to this for people that didn't even think this was possible? Sure. Uh, so again, it comes it comes from my passion of uh, uh, you know growing up in northern Ontario. I just I was on the water all the time fishing, and so when I started to get into stand up paddle boarding. Uh, I, I just love the platform for it. So I was able to, and, and I think one of the advantages of stand up paddle boarding, um, you know, whether you're kneeling, whether you're sitting, whether you're standing, you tend to have a better view and you can see a little bit more effectively. Uh, I love the simplicity of just grabbing board paddle, of course, safety gear, standing on the board and then, and then just paddling around and casting. I like the sort of run and gun, but uh, I have done some trips up in uh, Northwest Territories where we troll off the boards for uh, big lake trout. And so you just have a little system. You can actually set up a, uh, a little Scotty mount on your board and sort of glue that on. Some board companies now actually have the mounts built in. So again, if stand up fishing is your thing, then there's a board for you. Uh, but I, I just like the simplicity of it. And then once you do get a fish, uh, it's pretty fun sitting on the board getting sort of towed around by you know salmon on the bc coast or lake trout up on uh you know great slave lake so uh, again it's it's just another aspect of the sport that if you're into that i think it's a really fun way and again to me the the board is just about connecting to the water and so yeah you enjoy the fishing but uh, it's about being out there on the water and and uh, trying to get that figured out and as, as linda said just having fun with all aspects well, that's awesome. Uh, before we get to the question answer uh, part, uh, if people want to follow you, Lina, what's your Instagram so we can, if you're okay with handing yeah, yeah, that? Yeah, <laughs> of course. Um, it's my name, so it's just Lina Ogaitis, L-I-N-A-A-U-G-A-I-T-I-S. Um, and so, yeah, I post on Instagram and, and Facebook. Same. Okay. Same name. Thanks. Uh, Norm? <laughs> Yeah, same thing. You can sort of follow all the stuff we do uh, at Norm Han, N O R M H A N N, normhan.com, and you'll see everything uh, at Norm Han on, um, on Instagram. Cool. Uh, Dana's going to set us up with some uh, QA here. So, Dana? Hey, Trevor. Thanks, brother. Um, yeah, and, and uh, Linda and Norm and Trevor, if you guys could all share your uh, contact info via the chat, that would be awesome. I was just trying to type that in. <laughs> uh, don't worry, uh, yeah, so if anybody wants to get a hold of you guys, and we really appreciate you guys being here today and sharing with us. So yeah, if anybody's got any questions for these two, uh, fire away. We got just a couple minutes and we're going to do a drawing. Um, I think one of you guys sent us some um, sent us some gear to, to hand out, so we're going to give some of that away today and tomorrow, but uh, uh, yeah, please share. Got a question. Okay, so what about um, like paddle sailing, like open water? I've seen, I've seen some paddle boards where these guys and gals would literally set up a, almost like a jib or even a mainsail. Is there any advantage to uh, any adaptive surfers doing that? Have you guys tried any of that kind of uh, paddle board sailing? I, I can speak to a couple aspects of it. So we, we run trips down in Belize and um, what we've experimented with down there was sort of a small sail, a small circular sail that you could sort of attach to your paddle and then you could attach the bottom of it to the bungees on your board. And so as long as you had a straight downwind, it seemed to work pretty effectively. And you could do that on your knees, you could do it sitting down, standing up, what have you. It, it, it seemed to work fairly effectively. I think the next major big step that we've seen is using now the actual wing and foil boards 
Um, I live in Squamish, BC here, and we've got the Mecca for all things wind. So kite, kite surfing, foil surfing. And so we're now we're starting to see these, uh, the, the, the wing um, paired up with, with the foil boards or with the stand-up boards. And I know, oh, a, yeah, I know there's a bit of a learning curve with that for sure, like there is with anything. But yep. again, we're just, you know, we, we're seeing that progression in the sport. And I think if you're in, in an area that has uh, wind, I think that's a really amazing option. And just another aspect of the sport that, that you really, really enjoy. And so, you know, again, research sort of those companies that, that have that real nice uh, wing and it pairs up. I think it could pair up really well uh, on a paddleboard for, for adaptive situations and whatever, whatever you want to use it. I think I, I can see that. I can honestly see that for, for all athletes. But um, totally. yeah, I, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. I think it's, the ride would be so much smoother. I think they would uh, they'd be able to ride it anywhere. Flat water, ocean, I think would be a, a, an experience. Absolutely. And all you need is wind, right? So depending on where your path, your, where, where your, you know, your physical environment is or, or where the water is, hey, if you got a wing and a board, away you go. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Any other questions? All right, guys. Hey, thank you guys so much for being on here with us. Please stick around for a couple more minutes. Um, hey, so we got some stuff to give away uh, to folks that are on the call today and some uh, people that did the survey from last week. And just so everybody knows, um, after tomorrow's session, same time, same channel, all that good stuff, we'll uh, send you all out a survey to complete and you'll be put in the drawings for the, uh, the July 18th. Uh, virtual clinic uh, but so hey Doug are you there brother yep ready Dana all right so how are we doing this again am I going to throw out numbers and you pick them yeah so let's do the survey from the last event first I think all right um, so if you can pick a number from one two, three. pick a number from one to nine okay one to nine I want to go with let's, let's shoot high oh hey thin to win let's go for number one John um, Becker won that. So John Becker was... Seven. Becker seven. All right. John Becker, all right. Yeah, John won the hoodie. All right, outstanding. outstanding. Okay, so for today, let's do three for today. And you guys are going to get a, probably an amp surf hoodie and either a, a stand-up paddle boarding a hat or a t-shirt. Uh, compliments of the, the, uh, these three great people that were giving us that presentation. So um, just a quick question, Dan, but if you're not on the call, are you still legible? Can you still win a prize? Uh, if I pick the number, they pick the number. What the heck? Okay. So <laughs> give me a number between 1 and 48. Whew, 1 and 48. Let's go. Let's go. Big to win today. Let's go 47. 47. Nahomi Terabiro. Awesome. Way to go, Naomi. All right. All right. Well, then, uh, Naomi. Okay. All right. How about the next one? Let's Ready shoot for middle of the road. Would you say 148? So 24 and 24. Let's go 25. At the top on the upper end. Jason Wheeler. All right, Jace. I know Jace well. I did see him on here earlier. Uh, he's a good guy. Outstanding. And we got one more, right? One more. So let's go for, let's see, we did high, high. Let's go for middle of the road, low. Let's go 11. Uh, 11 is Doug Cox. All right, Doug, outstanding, outstanding. All right, is that Doug right there I see? Golf for Doug? Yeah, baby. All right, all right. Awesome, awesome. Hey, everybody. I'll, get, I'll, I'll get all that stuff shipped off on Monday to everyone. Awesome. And to all of our speakers, uh, if you guys could uh, send us your, uh, just respond to one of those emails I sent you with your uh, mailing address. We'll shoot you guys out some swag too for being a part of the call and, and everything. And uh, just, I know we're over, so I apologize. And I apologize for the technical difficulties we had today. Uh, I'm not sure why the little haul happened, but thank you everyone for being here tomorrow. Uh, we've got some more great speakers. We've got, uh, Melissa Chellis from uh, Adaptively Abled Amputees and Fitness, uh, also one of our surfers. We've got Team USA members, Josh Leola and uh, Christy Gardner, and uh, great uh, other uh, 
learning moments with uh, Tom from Central Coast Kayaks. Please share with your friends. Go ahead and share the ID. I don't care. Let's get more people on here. They won't be eligible for the drawings and stuff, but let's get more people on, get, get the message out there. So please share the meeting ID, share the contact info. Let's, uh, let's get some more folks on for the Rockaway Warriors weekend. Try to encourage all of our veterans friends to come on. And uh, again, thank you all so much and I really, really appreciate it. And uh, everybody wants to say a goodbye, by all means, say goodbyes. And we'll see you all tomorrow. Aloha. Thank you. Bye. Make sure you hit that concert for tonight for Hope for the Warriors. What time is the concert? Uh, I think it's at 8 or 8.30. 8.30. It's so tonight. 30 tonight. Moto Z. This will be playing for us tomorrow as well. Yeah. Mandatory for him. <laughs> this is for you, Dana, for giving me hard time. Oh, I love you, man. You're my, you're my aloha spirit. I want to bottle you up. Every time, everybody. everybody thank you so much for being here dennis thank Thanks you for, for having us uh, rounding it out love you all peace yeah, aloha you. mahalo chaka, we'll chaka, see you bro. tomorrow all right i'm going to the beach peace get some i'm, I'm, I'm out there to you brother tommy yeah can't all wait right. to see you guys love you all peace all righty grab some waves in your mind or in your heart but get out there